Welcome. Welcome back, everyone. So this afternoon, we will give you what you expect. That means uh, the truth on commercial instabilities and the banquet. So <laughs> probably, but you have to listen to the talk first. Uh, so just to, to, to summarize where we were yesterday, I have told you that many flames, not all of them, but many flames don't always do what you expect them to do, and they start developing commercial instabilities. And that, of course, for commercial instabilities, there are many complicated ways to look at them, but a single way to look at them is to look at the Weyle criterion, which is a criterion for instability, which says that if you push heat release into the flame at a moment where the pressure is positive, you are favoring the instability. Note that uh, this is the integral on the volume, so there can be places in the chamber which are actually pushing the instability and others which are damping it, exactly like the swing. Okay? If you get two or three people pushing the swing, some of them might push them in the right way, some of them in the wrong way. The overall result, you have to do the integral and you get the information. Note also that this integral is not only about space like here, it's also about time. Okay? Because same thing for the swing. If you push it right during the first passage, and then you push it wrong into the second passage, you have no effect. So this, this thing should also be averaged over time. Okay, what I want to do now is just remind you that, as always, the theoreticians have done that a long time ago, and so you must listen to those guys. Um, and uh, I want to just show a small comment on that. I see often people coming to me and telling me, I would like to make a burner which has no instability. What should I do? You know, I'd like to point out that uh, there, there is no uh, reason why a certain fuel type, size, shape, equivalence ratio, distribution, whatever, would lead to combustion instability or not. It depends only on the Rayleigh criterion. Okay? When you push a swing, whatever the shape of the swing is, the only question is, do you push it at the right time? And quite often, people expect that there is some kind of magical recipe where you use it and you will never have a commercial instability. No way. That doesn't exist. You cannot have any guarantee of that. So you have to look at the Weyle criterion, which is a complicated thing because it's actually a phase criterion between pressure, unsteady pressure, and unsteady heat release. When you look at the flame, you know, it's quite difficult to guess what this can be. So. Uh, the second thing to note is that for many commercial instabilities, things work in a very brutal, nonlinear way. In other words, you work at the current ratio of 0.6, you're happy. You go to 0.61, boom, everything explodes in two seconds. Okay? It's not a continuous thing. It's just before instability, you have no instability, and then it's gone. And it's also the same thing when you change the geometrical part. And here I will show the movie that, uh, that uh, was uh, mentioned by Mike uh, during the introduction. Uh, and uh, this movie corresponds actually so to something that we hear every year, or sometimes twice a year, of this guy working in industry. And, and the guy comes to us and always has the same story. He tells us, I had this wonderful machine, combustion chamber, and uh, I've been selling it to a lot of customers for a long time, never had any problems. And then uh, suddenly, uh, I've sold it to someone new who is using it in a very similar chamber, not exactly the same as before. And suddenly, now there are many terms for that. You know, you will find hooting, you know, making noise, buzzing, screaming, whatever. In other words, it's making so much noise that you cannot operate it. And sometimes it even dies, you know, after a few minutes. And he wants you to fix that in the next 20 seconds. So, what happened? Well, basically. What most of us are doing is always the same thing. We take a burner. What is a burner? It's a system where you mix, you go back to mixing, fuel and air. If you put this burner in air, usually it's not really useful. You have to put it in the chamber. And you are basically marrying the burner and the combustion chamber. It's a couple, okay? Those are, this is the system which you want to sell, actually. But many people sell only part of it. There are many chambers where you get only the chamber, you get the burner from someone else. Now, when this thing is changed 
you change either the burner or the combustion chamber, you may be changing the Rayleigh criterion and you don't even know it. And then you may be heading for big troubles, okay? Even if you don't know it. Whoa, 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 whoa. quite. <laughs> so let me go back to, the, to this example. Uh, since uh, I think Moshe yesterday was saying that G.I. Taylor was doing kitchen experiments, uh, I must confess that I'm also doing that. So this is an experiment you can do for maybe 30 euros. Or, so you just take a burner, that's a burner, okay? It's a system where you inject gas and air and you have a very nice premix flame. That's probably the cheapest burner you can build. And you put it in a chamber, okay? That's the, the, Poinceau, the Poinceau chamber are a little bit simple. The tubes, okay? You cannot make it simple. So I, I had three chambers, a short one, a medium one, and a long one. Easy. So what I'm going to do is to show you that when you put this burner into these chambers, you get very different behaviors. So let's put it first in the first uh, chamber, which is a short chamber. Come on. Happy. So you have the typical, uh, my daughter was taking the picture. <laughs> uh, uh, so you have a typical noise or just of gas flowing through a tube, okay? Not much happening. So then you, the following year, well, actually I did it in two minutes, but if you move now to the long tube and you sell this chamber to another customer, uh, this is what you find with the long tube. Again, not much, okay? It's, uh, so the customer will be happy. And so the third year, after year one, you sold the short tube. Year two, you sold the long tube. In year three, he asks you for medium tube, and you say, ah, easy, it works for the long one, it works for the short one, it's going to work for the medium one. And then you do that, and then you can see this, which is a little bit unpleasant, okay? So what's going on? Somehow, right. you have changed the Rayleigh criterion. And between the short and the long, there was a range where suddenly, the phase was matching and this thing got crazy. Now, when the thing is make, this thing is making noise, if you go to the lab now and do a visualization in a quartz tube, this is what you see for the flame. Instead of having a steady flame, it's a laminar flame, okay? It's not moving normally. Uh, you see that. You see now that the flame goes up and down at the frequency of the acoustic mode, and this is why we hear all this noise. And you see that the difference between a case which works and the case which fails is, you know, just make it a little bit shorter, a little bit longer. So it is not a simple thing. It is not something where you can say, take this length of tube and it will always be stable. No, it, uh, there will be all kinds of possibilities. Now, I've told you also yesterday that uh, um, what's happening initially here leads to a growth of an instability. What will eventually happen after a long time is a complicated story. You can have here a limit cycle. We call a limit cycle the phase where the oscillations have a steady uh, uh, amplitude. But you can also have unpleasant things before. Like, for example, here, you don't reach the limit cycle because the engine explodes before that. Or you can even have the flame which quenches completely. I will show an example now. And I want here to mention that we can do a lot of things uh, 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 to understand the commercial instabilities using active control. Active controls was pretty big in the 90s. I just want to, to describe a few results because they are quite nice, uh, even if we cannot use them really for industrial applications. So remember that uh, I told you that uh, the instability was coming from this loop here, the fact that some information comes back through the acoustic waves. So the idea, uh, our idea at that time was to say, okay, let's add another loop to counteract the action of that one. Um, you probably, probably some of you have that. Um, you know that uh, you can buy uh, helmets, which are called anti-noise, you know, uh, which are quite useful in an aircraft. And the way these helmets work is that if there's a noise arriving here, you have a small uh, microphone here which detects it and which sends here uh, another wave, which is exactly the opposite of this one. You know, it's sound, you know, so if, it's, if this sound here is sine omega t, you add here sine omega t 
close by, and you cancel the noise completely. And those things are quite efficient. Actually, many companies actually give them if you travel business. <laughs> Not me yet. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is the same idea. Okay? The idea is to say, if this loop here is giving the wrong signal, let's add another loop which will counteract this signal. How do you do that in practice? Well, you need to uh, install on your system a detector which must be unsteady, that can be an optical sensor for radicals, it can be a microphone, and then you need to install a loudspeaker to force and counteract the, influ uh, the in uh, influence that you have here. So we did that a long time ago uh, by using a very simple uh, system. Uh, here is a microphone, um, a delay line. We would take the signal of the microphone and push it a little bit, amplify it, send it back to a loudspeaker, and this thing would you know, create anti-noise. In that case, it's not really anti-noise, but it's the same principle. So this thing, you can uh, operate it uh, easily, and this is what you find as a function of the time delay. A time delay is also a phase shift, okay? If you're talking about a fixed frequency, this system was making an awful noise. So when you start your control system, and if the phase is between you know, minus 30 degrees and 70 degrees, the noise goes to zero. We used to do this show when, uh, for, for uh, sponsors, you know, you can just flip here, you flip it on, instability goes away, you flip it off, so it's a good, it's a, it's a good way to get some contracts. So now the, the thing about that is uh, you see that we enter the world where time is very important and all this happens at 500 hertz. So you don't want to make a mistake. If you use your system with the wrong phase, then you make the noise more and that, of course, is not a good idea. And that's the main problem of active control in a closed loop. It works very well, but you have to be extremely precise. Because if you are wrong here on your face, then you will make more noise. Now, you can, you can do it in a, different, in a different way here. I just want to show you the, how these things go over time. So this is time here. And you see that there's something interesting happening here. The instability is established, and then here you start your control system. And the control system initially has to, to be strong because it is counteracting a big oscillation. But you see that as time goes by, when you reach this point here, not only the oscillation is zero, but the power consumed by the loudspeaker is also zero. In other words, what this system is doing, it's keeping this thing straight, you know, not like that. And it doesn't take him a lot of, you know, efforts to do that because he's smart enough to move just a little bit to keep it what it should be. That means that every time that this system wants to start oscillating, the loudspeaker sends him another information to go in the other direction so that this thing is stable. And that's, I think it's a, when we did that at that time, it was, it was quite a lot of fun. Now, this thing was so exciting at that time that uh, everyone took patent. We had a patent. Uh, G took a patent, copying what we did. Uh, Siemens did it without copying the patent. They just told us, if you want to sue us, do it. You know? <laughs> so when you're working in the lab, you know, you say, OK, well, fine. <laughs> uh, uh, ultimately, it didn't really matter because uh, Siemens actually equipped a full gas turbine with this system. The installation, the cost was like a million euro, and it worked. But the problem was really to make that an industrial tool. The question is, it is so sensitive to small variations in time that it was just not worth doing it. Uh, the other reason why it didn't work also for iron engines, for gas turbines, for aircraft, is that the certification didn't work. That everyone, you know, on an engine, if you add a closed loop, uh, as soon as you say closed loop to a certification engineer, the guy says, no, 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 closed loop means it can fail. And if it fails, what happens? And of course, you have to recognize that if this thing fails, uh, they could make things worse. And you know of many accidents you know, in the aircraft industry where actually a closed loop system made strange things. I mean, 737 is one example. So, but anyway, on the scientific point of view, you can use active control to do all kinds of things. For example, a very interesting thing you can do is you can control your system, and at time t equal to zero, you remove the control. So now you are here, you're stable, and then you stop the control. So this thing will start oscillating, and you see here it's growing exponentially, and you can use this data to compute the growth rate. And as you know, the growth rate of an instability is what many models predict. So this is a very interesting way to measure the evolution from no instability to instability. 
Now, this is for a laminar flow. You can also do it for a turbulent flame. This is another turbulent flame from uh, Ecole Centrale here, uh, which is much bigger. This is like 100 kilowatts, so it's a serious flame. And this one is also making a lot of noise from time to time. So here we put a microphone here, listening to the flame, a delay line and an amplifier, and just send it back to the loudspeaker. And the loudspeaker was only pulsating the fuel, not the air, just because uh, the fuel has much more action on the flame than the air, and it's much less. Remember, we need only 5% of fuel compared to 95% of air. So if you want to be effective, you should pulsate the fuel in a, in a big flame. So here, of course, it, this is not laminar, so you have to look at the spectra. If you look at the spectra as a function of frequency, this is the noise here without control. And you recognize these peaks here, we'll come back to them. When you, when you see these peaks here on the spectrum, this is a signature of a strong instability, okay? Those peaks are very strong, they are you know, more than 20 dB uh, above the rest of the noise. And when you put the control on, you see that uh, you decrease this peak by 24 dB. 24 dB is enormous, okay? 24 dB, it means you don't hear anything anymore. So even for a turbulent flow, you can also ac apply active control and it works rather well. Now, the funny thing about that is uh, you can even use that all over the map of operation of the system. You know, for any combustor, this is the baseline map. You plot the fuel flow rate, you plot the air flow rate, and you put the results here of the combustion chamber. So, for example, in all this white zone here, you can operate it. In all these zones here, you cannot operate it. And in the wet zone, you can operate it, but it will make a lot of noise. This is without control. When you switch the active control on, you go to this map. And you see that the point A, which was here, becomes stable. That's OK. But there's another very interesting information. There's point B here, which you could never reach without control, suddenly will work. And that's where it's actually an indication of the fact that the, what we call the, the operability limits of a combustor quite often are controlled by the fact that when you reach the limit, the system becomes unstable. So in other words, before quenching, most flames start shaking. And we can prove that by starting by point B with, our, with control on and stopping the control. And you will see what happens. When we stop the control here, the instability will grow and will kill the flame. So this is the, the test which was done here. Control was on until this point, and you see the flame is burning. This is the emission uh, by a radical. So you see that when you stop the control, suddenly the flame says, oh, okay, I can oscillate because I got this radi criterion, which is positive. It starts oscillating, but it is shaking so much that at some point the flame goes away and cannot come back and completely disappears, and there's no flame left here. When you sit near the experiment, the whole thing takes about half a second, so you don't even hear it. You switch the control off, and poof, there's no flame. But in reality, it's not a chemical problem, it's not something like this, it's the fact that during this half second, you had all these instabilities. So you see that instabilities may also mean quenching. And quenching, of course, is a major problem. You know that most systems today, we try to operate them as lean as we can. And very often engineers think in terms of chemistry when it goes to lean quenching limit. But in reality, it's quenching because it's unstable, thermoacoustically unstable. And this was discovered only because we could trigger that exactly at the moment we wanted. Otherwise, uh, you would not, we would not even have thought about that. Okay, um, let, me, let me finish by another example of what's happening quite often with commercial instabilities. Uh, this is flashback. Flashback is what you expect it to be. That means the, the flame, which should sit, sit somewhere in the combustor, sometimes moves upstream of this point and it flashes back. When this happens, usually it's not a good idea because the, the combustor is, is not designed to, to, to handle a flame sitting there. So I'm going to show you another experiment of, uh, of Ecole Centrale. This is a, a simple flame stabilized behind a, a backward-facing step here, and it is swirled, and uh, it is premixed actually upstream here. We inject the fuel here and the air here. And you will see that this flame, and that was observed also experimentally, this flame uh, is uh, very sensitive to oscillations, 
and these oscillations then can lead to flashback. So we, look, we are going to look at a simulation which includes all the wet parts here and which stops here in the, in the exhaust of the burner. So just a view on the mesh here. This is an old computation. There was not that many mesh points. And so here you see the, the flame surface. That's where the flame is uh, sitting. The flame is anchored here at the lips of the tube. And what you see is the plot of velocity on the isosurface of temperature. So as soon as we start this simulation, uh, acoustic oscillations begin. So you see the acoustic oscillations, what they do, they carry the flame down and then up and then down and then up. You know, you can see the pressure here. And every time this keeps increasing, the flame is moving more and more. And you see here, for example, it even started propagating into the tube. So when, as this thing keeps increasing, at some point, the flame will say, OK, I quit. I cannot stay there. I want to go upstream, upstream. Not yet. And then suddenly, well, remember, all that happens at 600 hertz. OK, in real time, it would take a 0.1 second. OK, I think it's the last one here. Now the flame is going to move upstream. And once it is upstream, there's not much you can do. OK, now it's there. OK, and you see now that the flame is not stabilized here anymore. It's stabilized upstream in the tube here. And that's the end of the, of the chamber. You have to stop the experiment right away. So you see that some acoustics can lead to quenching. Some acoustics can lead to flashback. And uh, so we'd better avoid them if we can. At least to begin with, we should study them. So how do we study these things? OK, this is what I want to, to describe now. OK, I think it's pretty clear now. I hope I convinced you that uh, we need to worry about that a little bit. Uh, um, so let me just remind you a little bit about the basics. We talked about acoustics already, so that that's done. I want to show you the spectra. If you do any turbulent flames, you will uh, look at the pressure spectra. And usually, the pressure spectra for a flame, they look like this. This is called broadband combustion noise, uh, probably peaking below 1,000 hertz. And uh, this is the noise that you hear when, you, when an aircraft is taking off, for example. But if you have a combustion instability, this is what you will observe. On top of this broadband spectrum, you will have peaks very sharp peaks, usually like 20 dBs above the broadband noise. If you have these peaks, it's a good signature that something is not going right. Now, some scaling. When we talk about acoustics yesterday, I told you that if you have a pressure oscillation P prime, it's inducing a velocity oscillation U prime, which is P prime over rho C. Rho is the density, C is the sound speed. So if you look, if you ask an engineer now, what is the typical level of oscillation of pressure in your chamber, he will tell you, well, you know, it depends. But we, if it goes beyond 20,000, we are in trouble. Uh, so let's say 1,000 pascal to 20,000 pascal. You divide that by rho C, and you find that UA, the velocity which is induced by the acoustics, can go up to 20 meters per second. Now remember, the flame speed is 0.5 meters per second. In other words, a flame submitted to an acoustic wave of this magnitude will just follow the wave. It has no choice, OK? The wave's going too fast. So quite often, we talk about turbulent combustion. But uh, in many cases, this turbulent combustion is actually driven by acoustics. So I just want to, to show you actually a few, uh, few examples. This is my PhD, uh, my second PhD. I did two. In those days, we were doing two. So this is a, a premix flame stabilized. Here, there are five of them. We are looking at the central one. There's a hole here where we inject uh, propane and air. And you can see the flame here. It's not symmetrical because of gravity, buoyancy effect. So the flame is like this for a steady case. Now, this flame, when you change the equivalence ratio, this is a view, a Schliemann view. Uh, uh, and you can see the jet of fresh gases here. The flames are here on both sides. And this is full of burned gases. Now, when the flow is stable, this is what you observe. If you change the equivalence ratio a little bit, suddenly the whole chamber becomes blue. 
uh, and the walls here become wet, and you have to stop the, uh, the whole thing uh, before it uh, melts. And if you do a visualization of the flow there, this is what you observe. Okay? Instead of this shape here, you have this very nice vortex here, which is formed at the frequency of the instability, which is 530 hertz. And you can actually uh, make a movie, well, movie of those days, uh, of this thing. So you see the vortex is created, it goes, there is interaction with the neighbors, and it goes away, and there's, an, there's another one. And of course, when the chamber is operated in this regime, uh, uh, you cannot do much with it. Huh? Um, the important thing to note is, uh, why do we get this vortex? Well, you get a vortex like this because the velocity here is changing a lot. Okay? It's a few meters per second of pulsation, and you know that this is, uh, for those of you who still smoke, you can do that when you smoke. You, know, you puff, and you create a vortex, which has exactly this shape. So the, this vortex is here because the flow rate here is very strongly oscillating. In that case, we were, uh, I'll talk about that later too, but uh, the hole is small enough that the flame cannot go back into the hole. It cannot flash back here. But there are cases like the one I've shown you uh, yesterday uh, for this flame here, where the flame actually flashes back because the blockage is not enough. So now the speed here, the convective speed, is actually changing sign. At this moment, now it's five meters per second, and at this moment, it's minus five. And the flame just say, okay, it's minus five, I cannot fight, I, I'm following you, you know? So the flame is convected by the acoustic field. So the acoustic field is not a detail uh, uh, on the whole flow field, it is, it is a major problem. I'm putting that back to show you also that even instability can be unstable. They are not always doing the same noise, which means that they are actually not always uh, operating on the same uh, on the same unstable case. Uh, if you listen to it, it will change the noise. Which makes our life miserable even more because it says that uh, an instability can last for a certain time and then disappear, then come back, etc. So uh, it's, it's well, that's okay. okay. That's that's what it is. If you do an experiment, you will you will you will see that. So how do we study that now? Okay. Once you have said okay, it's important. The, the sponsors come to your lab and they say okay, fix the problem. Okay. How do I fix the problem? Well, there are two ways at least to fix the problem. One method is just to say I'm going to do a huge LES for you and predict the instabilities and tell you how to suppress them. That works. It's just very expensive. Uh, so, so that a lot of people prefer to use what we call acoustic code. So uh, I will describe the two methods rapidly. The first one, to give you an example, uh, we use, for example, uh, in uh, most chambers, and it's a, exactly an LES code. The standard compressible LES code can be used. The only thing that we neglect is the small scales of turbulence, those that we averaged yesterday. Remember, we filtered them. We said, OK, those are small eddies. We don't care about them. After that, we neglect nothing. We keep acoustics, we keep everything. Now, this is, for example, what we did for a full chamber here, where there is an acoustic mode, which is uh, azimuthal mode. And you can see the pressure waves turning here. And you see the, the flames here dancing in the, in the acoustic field. And this matches the experiment extremely well, but it costs 10 million CPU hours. So uh, it's, it's a good solution, but that's not the preferred solution for, for industry. So it's really a rich man's method. And it also has another problem, is that even if it captures the instability, quite often, you don't really understand why it's there. So people prefer to go to the second method, which is called acoustic codes. So acoustic codes follow a different way. You start from the Navier-Stokes equation, and you do what I've done yesterday. You linearize them. That means you say everything is a mean component plus a perturbation. The perturbation is small, and I will only uh, keep the leading order in the expansion. So just so that you don't get confused, uh, it, the derivation of acoustic codes and of LES starts from the same method. You say u equal u bar plus u prime, the, you plug it here. But then the two paths differ. In LES, you model this term, which is the correlation. In acoustic, you say u prime is small. 
So u prime multiplied by du prime is even smaller. It's of order two. So I just remove it. And I keep only the leading order terms, which makes all the equations linear, which makes them much easier to solve. You can actually look for the eigenvalue of the problems. And this is what you would do for the pendulum. That's the method I've shown you for the pendulum. You look for the linear problem, and you can solve it much more easily than LES. So usually, we do that in what we call the frequency domain. Because the equations are linear, we say, suppose everything is oscillating like sine omega t, what should omega be? And then the code will tell you omega equals 2056 hertz. And so this is uh, the type of method that you will find in almost all companies uh, which had to deal with commercial instabilities. Um, and all the others uh, is just going to happen soon. So an interesting question is when you do this acoustic codes, what, where is the flame? Okay. Well, and uh, the, the flame has to be modeled using something we call the flame transfer function. So let me explain what the flame transfer function is. Here, when you pulsate a chamber, you create uh, an unsteady combustion. Okay? The flame transfer function objective is to model only this part from here to here. You tell the flame, I sent you a certain U prime, and the flame transfer function will tell you what Q prime will be. Okay? So the flame transfer function quantifies how much unsteady combustion will respond to a perturbation of the inlet flow rate. Now, this can be uh, uh, formalized in different ways, but for us, it really means that we are now cutting our problem in two. Everything which is acoustic, we keep in what we call the acoustic world. That means the pressure wave doing an acoustic feedback, creating another flow rate, all this is acoustic. And everything which is not acoustic here, the fact that you create a vortex, that you have combustion, this is all in the combustion world, we replace completely by Q prime equal a function of U prime. That's what we call the FTF. Interestingly, actually, the first guy who proposed that, I met him with my PhD advisor, is Luigi Croco. He, he was at my school, and before that, he was at Princeton. And he was the one who said, ah, this is too complicated. Let's replace everything by just this thing. You know, by the way, when you do that for a flame, you realize that uh, it's not a good idea to have a big N, right away. Because if you have a big N, it means that a small perturbation of velocity will generate a large variation of Q. That's not good, OK? If N equals 0, you have no instability. Okay? Now, in addition, tau. Tau is a time delay. The tau is very important. Tau tells you how long the flame will respond to perturbation. So you shake the inlet. You wait, and how many seconds after you shake the inlet, poof, you see Q prime. That will be important for the Rayleigh criterion. I will show that in a second. If the tau is changing, you are playing you know, with the delay, and at some point, the pressure, uh, the Q prime peak might fit the P prime peak, and then you go into instability. So this contains enough physics to describe instabilities. And it was really the idea of Luigi Cuoco before the war already. In those days, they had lots of problems with rocket engines, and this is where the idea came from. So why does this solve our problem for acoustic codes? Well, in an acoustic code, remember we derived that yesterday, the heat release is here. All of that is acoustic, the heat release not. But if we can replace it with U prime, then uh, the only thing that the flames are really doing, they act like uh, loudspeakers. And then we can do everything in the acoustic world. So I've said that already. So uh, we can jump that and go to uh, where we are at the moment. So I've shown you that the Rayleigh criterion is the simplest way to look at instabilities. I've shown you that you are really, if you are really rich, you can imagine to do full compressible large dissimulation of the whole chamber and of the boundary conditions. I will come back to that later. And you can also use acoustic codes, which I just described, if you are ready to build a flame transfer function. So we use the Rayleigh criterion for simple cases. But uh, if you go to companies, you will see that most of them are actually using these two together. Usually, they try to do it with their one's code, and they give up rapidly. And mo many of them are actually developing LES to do that. But these tools are standard uh, in many companies. They have their own tools to do that. So let me, let me show you how, to, how you can use the Rayleigh criterion for a very simple case that we showed before, which is the Ricker tube. Ricker, by the way, 
uh, was just the first guy who started doing instabilities in this, uh, in this configuration. So this is the tube on the movie I've shown you before. You have an open inlet, open outlet. For an acoustic guy, what that means is that here, pressure is constant because you cannot move the atmosphere. And same thing on the top, pressure is constant. So we have two boundary conditions, and I'm going to show you how to uh, build a criterion and say when the instability will begin or not. So that, that used to be a, a, a homework, uh, so I'm going to give you the question and the answer. So the question was, uh, uh, first, find the first acoustic mode in these systems, assuming that the temperature is not changing and that the pressure is imposed at both ends, and then using the Rayleigh criterion to derive the stability limits. And uh, it's an interesting thing in those tubes that people know that uh, if you put the flame between this point and this point, you have an unstable mode, and if you put it between this mode and that mode, you don't have an unstable mode. Uh, so you will see that this can be explained easily here with the Rayleigh criterion. So first thing is acoustics without flame. Okay, this is a simple exercise of acoustics, you know. I've shown you already that uh, the pressure in general is the sum of a wave going up and a wave going down, and the amplitude of these two waves are A and B, and the question is to find them. So this describes uh, the propagation of acoustic waves from here to here. You need to apply the boundary condition so you need to say that P prime at the bottom is always zero, and P prime at the top is always zero. So that gives you a condition of A and B, you know, A minus B equal blah, blah. And uh, from that, the first one tells you that A equals B, and the second one tells you that this is possible only if sine KL equals zero, which gives you actually the wavelength lambda equal to 2L, which, you know, <laughs> it's kind of obvious here. The, the first mode that you can have here is a mode where pressure is zero here, goes to a maximum here, and is zero again here. So that means it has a wavelength, which is two times the length of the tube. Okay? That's the only way to satisfy the boundary conditions, is to have a wavelength which is equal to uh, two times the length of the tube, so that you, if you know the wavelengths, you know, you have the, the frequency just by this formula. Here you find that the, the frequency is about 170 hertz for the tube that we took. Once you know the frequency, you can uh, go back here in A and B, replace them, and obtain this expression for the velocity and for the pressure. I cannot tell you what A is, okay? A is the amplitude of the mode. Since we're looking at a linear problem, A could be anything, as long as it's small. Okay, don't make it too big, but in the linear regime, like for example, when I'm talking now, this is obviously in the linear regime, so any amplitude will do here for A, and we don't need to say how much it is for the moment. So if you look at one instant, the shape of the pressure oscillation will be like this, and the shape of the velocity will be like that. And uh, now we, what we're going to do is going to say, let's add the flame on top of that and hope that for the moment we say that the flame is a small flame, it doesn't change the temperature. We're going to keep the same acoustic uh, speed, sound speed. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, not complicated. You say, let's put the flame at the distance A of the inlet of the tube here. So we put the flame at x equal A. Now, at this point x equal A, we can plot at one instant, for example, the pressure, oh, sorry, it's not one instant, as a function of time. So this is the pressure, this is the velocity. This is just uh, this formula, okay? If you go back here, these two formula, you just, just code them and that's easy and you obtain these shapes. And uh, if you would go to another position, like this is point two, this is what you would obtain, of course, the shape and the phase is different as a function of time. So now we put combustion on. And we start by saying that combustion will uh, have a time delay of 0.2 times the period. Uh, this is a typical order of magnitude for these delays. They are not usually not that big, okay? The flame reacts rather fast. So if you put now a flame in the system, you see that you can plot, as before, the pressure, the velocity, and if the velocity is here, the heat release is the red curve should be the same curve shifted by tau. And now the question for Rayleigh is, is this curve in phase with pressure? Okay. 
You see that here it's not really true. The good way to check that is to actually multiply pressure by heat release. And if you do that, you obtain this curve, and you see that uh, they are never in phase. That means the product of the two is always negative, which means that this will be a stable case. Okay. Now, if you take the flame now, and instead of putting it at A over L equal point A, that means in the top half, you bring it to the lower half, which is point two. This is what you obtain now. The velocity is here. The heat release is the red curve. And you see that now heat release and pressure, unfortunately, are quite in phase, or not far from it, so that the product P prime Q prime is actually positive. And so this case will be unstable. Okay. You can actually do that in a more, in a more general way. You can you know, just compute P prime Q prime as a function of A. This is what you obtain. 2A squared sine 2KX T sine omega tau. And in general, sine omega tau is positive, so that we see that the criterion of stability, of instability, is that this sinus 2kx must be more than 0, and that means that x must be less than L over 2, which is what we observe experimentally. You take this tube, the flame should be in the lower half. If you put it in the top half, there will be no instability. So you see here, for such a simple case, the Rayleigh criterion is sufficient to explain things. You will see that, uh, uh, in general, it will be a little bit more complicated. Now, why is it more complicated? I've already told you that uh, the way the criterion controls this term, so that's the strength of the, of the, of the push you know, for the instability. But there's also the fluxes, uh, uh, and maybe the fluxes can compensate the Rayleigh criterion. So the Rayleigh criterion is only necessary. It's not sufficient for your flame to oscillate. But what is true is that the delay is always needed. If you have no delay in this formula, in the flame transfer function, you will have no instability. The thing which is worrying, of course, for industry is the fact that uh, these things are not monotonic. Okay? As a function of length, you can be stable, unstable, and stable. That's bad. Okay? In industry, we don't like that. That means, for example, that's the example I've shown you, that uh, this burner into these three chambers is not working for the middle one. That's bad news. So industry now starts to worry about, about stability because they, they have to. So I need to say a few words about impedances now. This is the, 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 the maximum I will do about acoustics, but you need to know this word because it controls a lot of things. You've seen that explaining the Ricoh tube instability takes four pages. If you know course 101 in acoustics and really, you got it. Okay? It's very simple. Uh, so why is it a problem in real systems? Well, because in real systems, we don't know the acoustic conditions. And the acoustic conditions, describing the acoustic conditions in a chamber is actually equivalent to describing the impedances of this thing. The imped impedances of a tube, this is the ratio between P prime and U prime. When you know the impedance, you know what's going to happen. The impedance was zero for the weaker tube, but for other tubes, it's not. You see here, we have said that P prime was equal to zero. This is why we were able to derive the acoustics. But what happens in real systems? Well, <laughs> that's not so simple, because here the combustion chamber is not open at both ends. Here the combustion chamber starts at the outlet of the compressor and ends at the inlet of the turbine. So then you start hitting the question, what is the impedance of the compressor and of the turbine? And then right away, your life becomes miserable, okay? Because you have to talk about the impedance of a system where you have rotating parts and then uh, it, is, it is a big issue. So as soon as you talk about waves, leaving the chamber and hitting uh, rotating parts, uh, you have to worry about what's happening when waves cross a variable system with rotation. And this is uh, not simple. Uh, there are effects due to the fact that these things are turning. There are also effects due to the fact that the area changes when you propagate through the rotating system. So just to show you here, for example, an acoustic wave hitting a nozzle. You see that when an acoustic wave hits a nozzle, well, actually, you get reflection. And what we need to know is how much is reflected compared to the incident wave and with which phase. Because again, the phase, remember, the phase will control the FTF. So this is a problem. If you want the right impedances, we need to be able to know that. 
Another thing I want to mention, which uh, that's probably also the maximum I will do, is that it is not only about acoustic wave. Entropy waves also do strange things. Just to remind you what entropy waves mean, it's in the chamber. Uh, if the mean temperature at the outlet is 1600 K, you can have hot pockets or cold pockets propagating through the outlet. Now, when these pockets of hot or cold gases touch the turbine, unfortunately, they don't go by like this. They go through the turbine and they make noise. This noise may come back and excite instabilities. And this happens. I will give you an example here. First, this is an entropy wave entering a nozzle. And you see that when it, this is temperature, when it enters the nozzle, it makes noise too. So you can have noise generated by entropy wave crossing outlet of the chamber. And that's, that's bad. It's so bad that you can actually create, uh, let me jump right away to this example. This is the, uh, uh, an engine that developed in France. You can recognize you know, the, the complexity of this animal. But the important thing to see is that it's, it's terminated by a nozzle. Okay? So you will see in the next movie that there are two cases here. The nozzle is here, and there are cases like this one where you see entropy waves, this big hotspot, propagating through the nozzle. And what they do, they introduce a big pressure wave, which comes back and creates a new entropy wave, and this system oscillates. By the way, the reason this simulation was done is that this is the same engine. This is a dry day, and this is a rainy day. Okay, when the temperature of the inlet changes because of evaporation. Here you lose 100K or more than that, where suddenly the engine becomes unstable. So you have an, engine, you have a, a, an aircraft which can run only uh, when it's dry. Not good, huh? So it really means that uh, when you really want to do commercial instabilities, you will need to worry about acoustics, so you will need to worry about impedances which describe what's happening at the end of the chamber and at the uh, inlet of the chamber. So just to remind you what I said, the way we describe impedances in acoustics, we say it's the ratio of pressure oscillations to velocity oscillations at the same point. If you know that, if you know this quantity, you can solve the acoustic problem. Except that uh, knowing these things is a little bit difficult. Let me, let me give you examples where we know impedances. Um, which are maybe not always uh, uh, intuitive. If you, if you have a wall here, u prime is going to be equal to zero, so the impedance is infinite. OK, that's simple. Uh, if your chamber finishes in open air, that's not the case for most chambers in the real engines, then p prime will be equal to zero so that uh, the impedance is, is zero. If the tube is so long that nothing comes back, OK, that's called a non-reflecting outlet here, then P prime over U prime will be equal to rho C. Uh, because all the waves are propagating in the right direction and no one is coming back. And so the problem is that uh, in a real system, you have the chamber which is here and it's flowing through the turbine. You have to determine the impedance here and usually you don't know it. Okay? So that's a big unknown in the problem. Uh, so I just want to show you um, a table here of uh, impedances for the cases which I just described. There are a few cases where we know what's going on, but in most cases, we will need to measure impedances. And again, if you go to Siemens or to Alstom, they have teams which do that. They measure the impedance, and they, you can imagine the benches you need to do that. Those are monsters. So just to give you an idea in the lab how this looks, uh, in the lab it's much easier. You, know, you put loudspeaker, you send waves, and you look at how much is reflected, and you can construct the impedance from that. And uh, this is a typical view of the impedance of, an of, a, of a bench in a laboratory. It's not constant. You know, it has a, a gain and a phase, and you need to determine both of them. And that usually uh, controls the instability. And it also explains why, for certain cases, if you change that, then you will change the instability. In other words, and that's a major issue for all combustion projects, if you ask me if this chamber is unstable, I will tell you, I don't know. The instabilities of this chamber depend on this chamber and on the impedance here and the impedance here. 
And if you do an experiment in a lab, and you fit that to another line compared to the real engine, you may very well have a stable engine in the lab, and when you bring it to the real engine, it would become unstable. And so that's a major issue in engines because it means you have a risk here that if you develop things with different impedances, then when you go to the real engine, it might just you know, blow up. And so uh, for industry, uh, um, this risk is at the moment usually ignored. That means they know that they take this risk, and if there is a problem, they will play around. You know, industry, what they do, they create a task force. But once you have a task force, of course, everything gets it's much easier to solve. Huh? on the paper. OK, um, I'm going to stop here for, for instabilities in gas turbines. And I want to talk about instabilities in a different uh, configuration. Um, and that's something which looks like a piston engine, uh, but, but which is not really a piston engine. It's uh, one of the innovative engines that we consider for the moment, um, if I can find it. Uh, you know that uh, I've told you already that uh, gas turbines need to be improved. And one way to improve them is to change the cycles in the gas turbines. And uh, what do we mean by cycles? Uh, it's uh, the way you operate the chamber. So there are quite a few groups in, in Europe doing that. I told you about rotating detonation. Another concept is what we call constant volume uh, combustion. So constant volume combustion, if this thing is not dying on me, this is PowerPoint, you know, I'm never using PowerPoint normally, so uh, he hates me. I'm going to convert it to Keynote. Okay, it seems he's happy now. Huh? OK, so what is constant volume combustion? You all know constant volume combustion chambers, those piston engines. In a piston engine, typically, the piston goes up. And then during the time of combustion, it's almost not moving. So it is a constant volume in which combustion develops. That's why piston engines are so efficient. Okay, at the moment, today, you can build piston engines for gasoline, which can go up to efficiency of the order 50%. 52, 48, I mean, it's a, a Formula One engine has more than that, more than 50%. While a gas turbine has problems to go beyond 32. Or so. So it's, a, it's much more efficient to burn things in constant volume. Uh, I will just remind you why. And here we studied one of these chambers not for a piston engine. So there is no rotating part here, you will see. But it is still constant volume combustion. And interestingly, those things also develop instabilities. The instabilities here are not the fact that the chamber is moving, the flame is moving in the chamber. It's the fact that cycle after cycle, you may have different results. Okay? It's a cycle to cycle variation problem. So, uh, well, you remember I, I've told you already you know, that uh, these cycle to cycle variations occur everywhere. That's a better movie than the one I've shown you. Uh, and of course, <laughs> Here, you would like every cycle to be the same. Well, it's the same in an engine. Huh? If you miss one cycle, uh, the doctor will tell you what, what to do. I mean, it happens, as you know, huh, for in hearts. People feel it. You know, can beep, 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 beep. Uh, it's not fun. You will see that when you get older. Uh, so if you, if you have that in an engine, you, you, you have a problem. So let me just remind you here why we would do that. We would do that because uh, normally on the paper, uh, the cycle which is used at constant pressure is much less efficient than the cycle of Humphrey, which is a cycle where you burn at constant volume so that if you are constant volume, the pressure goes much higher. You know that, you know, it's also, uh, remember we talked about the adiabatic flame temperature? T2 minus T1 equal Q over Cp when you're at constant pressure. If you do it at constant volume, it's T2 minus T1 equal Q over Cv. And Cv is much less than Cp. So the temperature will go higher, the pressure will go higher, and the efficiency of this cycle can be up to maybe you know, 15, 20% higher than the cycle that we have today. So it's a very attractive idea 
to uh, use the Humphrey cycle where you uh, go to higher temperatures uh, than to use the classical cycle. And if, as a function of the compression weight, which is the pressure, if you want, in the chamber, you see that the Humphrey cycle is burning at a very high efficiency compared to other cycles that we have today. So, of course, people say, okay, let's try to put that in a gas turbine. Hey. Well, in a gas turbine, of course, you could put a piston engine instead of the gas turbine, but there are good reasons not to do that. And so you try to replace the combustion chamber of a gas turbine by a constant volume system. Now, uh, how do you do that? Well, one way to do it is to use rotating detonation. I've shown you this movie already. Uh, and uh, the problem of rotating detonation is that it's a little bit radical. Huh? Uh, you need to change a lot of things here to be able to operate an engine like this uh, in the real world. People are looking at it, but it's complicated. So the other solution is to use the same thing you have uh, in an engine with uh, valves. Uh, the only way to do something which is constant volume, if you don't do detonation, is to uh, isolate the chamber during combustion. So you have to close the inlet and close the outlet. So you need to introduce all these rotating parts. It can be done by many ways. This is the wave water. This is not the one we tested. We're going to talk about what you call here thermoreactor, which is a system where you have valves at the inlet, valves at the outlet, so that when combustion develops, you have something closed. And then the pressure will go to higher values. Now, of course, uh, it's easier to, to talk about it than to do it. But the experiment was built. In, uh, in Poitiers, in France. And uh, just to give you an idea of how it looks, you get these valves here at the inlet, which let the air come in. You inject uh, fuel here. And then when you need to burn, you close the two valves and you do the combustion in this domain. It's a very interesting uh, uh, combustion experiment, as you will see, because it does all kinds of strange things. Uh, so during the intake, Everything comes in here. You still have the outlet, which is open. So there's a scavenging problem, which is the same that you have in a piston engine. There. You need to push the fresh gases here and stop pushing before they start leaving, because then you will lose them. So you are pushing the burned gases out. But then this thing should be closed when? At that time, OK? Because at that time, otherwise, you're going to lose some of the charge. So then you close the outlet, you close the inlet, and you can burn. Beam, OK? And then you open the outlet, and you let the burnt gases go out, and you do it again, OK? On the paper, it's simple. It's like a piston engine where the piston would not move. OK, so this thing is built, actually, in Poitiers. And we're going to do an LES of that and compare it to Poitiers. Well, the first thing that they saw when they did the experiment is that one of the problems was that it was difficult to repeat cycle after cycle. And, uh, we will explain why in a second, because this is also a type of uh, combustion instability. OK, so this is a view of the, of the combustion domain here, where, which we will compute. We need to start far upstream and to continue far downstream for boundary conditions. Like always, it's always a problem for LES. You need to find a place where you know the boundary condition, and it's not that simple. And uh, here you see the animation of the geometry. So here, if you're the PhD doing that, <laughs> you know that uh, meshing is going to be an issue. Uh, that's OK. I mean, it's the job of the PhD. Huh? Uh, so this is a view of the section of the inlet valves and of the outlet. No, the outlet valve and the inlet valve. So you see here the overlap between the two. There is a long time during which the intake is open and the exhaust is not yet closed. That's OK. Uh, if you can design that in a right way, you will not lose too much fuel there. So exhaust phase, intake, and then finally combustion phase where all valves are closed. Okay. So on the paper, this could be a good thing to take and replace in a gas turbine. Okay. You could take the existing chamber out and put that at the, sa at the same place. So. If you look now at uh, the, the, the result of this thing, you have to worry about ignition. We talk about ignition maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Ignition, of course, is a problem. Ignition is always a problem for flames. But here, it's even more of a problem 
because the flow here is going fast. You're going to tell me, oh, it's the same in a piston engine. No, because in a piston engine, when you close down the valves, you have all this compression phase where the flow slows down. Here, you don't have time for that. Uh, you have to ignite right away, so you have to ignite in a high-speed flow. Ignition in a high-speed flow is a major problem. Some people actually in this room may do that. If you do supersonic combustion, we know it's complicated, and it's complicated here, as you will see. So once you ignite during the combustion phase, the, the way, you, the way you, you do that, you can look first at the flame view. You have the, the blue zone is the flame. So you ignite here, you start seeing this very distorted turbulent flame, which goes through the whole chamber, and finally everything's burnt, and then you can do it again. Now, the fuel here is injected before the combustion chamber. So for those of you who do piston engines, we, we would call that indirect uh, injection. Uh, because uh, it, we could have injected in the chamber, but not for this case. So let me show you the, 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 and the injections go here, okay? They are performed uh, during the, the, this phase here. While we do combustion, we put fuel in the, in the chamber, upstream of the chamber. So you can do different rotation regimes, of course, for the valves. Here we did 1,000, 2,000, and uh, you will see the, the, the results on the, on the on the pressure curves. So how do you measure the efficiency of combustion in a system like this? Well, the easiest thing is to look at pressure. So you see you ignite here, and poof, pressure goes up, and pressure should go you know, to the maximum value. Again, we want to go to high values of pressure. This is what makes uh, uh, efficiencies. So when you do that, you see that the first problem you have is that uh, you do it for one cycle. And you know, this is the moment where the PhD student says, oh, I'll never go to that, because Every time he's doing one cycle, he has a different result. So this is one cycle, this is another one, this is another one, and uh, this one here, total failure, okay? No ignition. Well, after that, he got a good one, and after, when you put all the cycles on the same curve, you see again combustion instabilities. You see again that combustion has this problem of not doing the same thing every time, which is a pain because, you know, it would be so easy if it would always be the same. Those of you who do kinetics, for example, when you do shock tube ignition, it's always the same. You can repeat it 10 times, the same result. Not with turbulence. As soon as turbulence is in the picture, it's going to be a mess. So you see here that you have cycle-to-cycle -cycle variations, exactly like the flame in a gas turbine can be oscillating. It's the same phenomenon. It's the fact that those things like to be, uh, let's say, uh, difficult to repeat. OK, so this is an experiment. So, uh, and I'm going to, to stop here. Uh, after the break, I will show you the same thing with simulations. And the simulations were used to explain why the experiment was unstable. So we can take a short break, and maybe we can also answer questions if there are questions. Yes? Yeah. Okay, you have to go back again. You go back to the, the fundamentalists here, the, the theoreticians, and they will show you that if you have at, this, at the same place a change in velocity and a gradient of temperature, that will reflect into, into a pressure wave. So you, if you combine flow acceleration and entropy, you generate noise. That's a field in itself, okay? The guys doing combustion noise, uh, they, they work a lot on that. Because not only making noise going backwards, but they also make noise going downstream. And that contributes a lot to the noise that you hear when you listen to an aircraft. A lot, a lot of this noise is entropy noise converted, converted into acoustic noise in the turbine. Complicated business. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, the, the active control loop that I've shown you, uh, Ecole Centrale, after that, they did the self-adaptive active control. That means you have the loop of the acoustics plus the loop of the active control plus a third loop controlling the active control. So then industry got crazy. They said, you know, we're never going to industrialize that. But it worked. That means you could start the engine, and uh, the control loop will adjust itself until it would kill the instability. And it works really well. And today, it would be very easy to do. It's not applied again, as I told you, because 
people would like, even you, you know, what do you prefer? Do you prefer flying in an aircraft which is stable by nature? Or do you prefer flying in an aircraft where you get three loops talking together in a computer which may fail? I'm sure you know the answer. And so this is why we don't do it. Just because it's too difficult to certify and to be sure that we'll not fail. There are so many things which can fail already. So we don't want to do it. But uh, it's definitely working, absolutely. Yeah, uh, for gas power turbine, like Siemens, the question was the price. They, it worked. They, they used it, actually, on production side, but it was costing about a million euros. And they said, again, let's find a technology which is stable by nature, which is, I understand. I mean, it's because when they did that, they needed 18, because they had 18, bur no, 24 burners. For each burner, they needed a PC plus a high-speed valve plus a a reliable accelerometer, I mean, this is too much. They just said, too complicated. So if the Germans tell you it's too complicated, it's too complicated. <laughs> is there a primary method for active control through pressure oscillations You can do active control with almost anything, okay? Yeah. We even did active control by shaking the injectors with a, a, a mechanical device. Uh, you can do it with a pulsation of the fuel flow rate. You can shake the air flow rate. You can, anything, can, anything which plays a role on the flame will do it. And uh, people have played with that. There's absolutely no doubt it works. It's, uh, it's yes? Looking for a PhD? <laughs> Come talk to me. That's a very good question because the flow is actually, yeah, you're right. I, I'm, I'm, I asked the same question when I did the demo. Uh, it's symmetrical only apparently because there is a flow direction and that when you write Q prime equal U prime T minus tau, it knows that it's in this direction. Because otherwise, you're right. I mean, how, do, how would it should work the other way? Huh? No, it's only because uh, the direction is imposed by the tau in the, in the FTF formulation. But that's a, that's a pretty good question. Yeah. Uh, there was another one, yeah? Is it that because the odd gas is going up? Yeah. If you, if, if you flip the right rotation, yeah. it will happen. The noise will go. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you cannot do it because when you flip it downwards, you burn your hand, OK? <laughs> you should yeah. put the flame like this. So. Yeah. You can, actually, if you, if you impose not. Here, the air is entrained, okay? If you push it with a compressor, you can do it in any direction, okay? But for the experiment, you know, this is my kitchen experiment. Okay? So uh, it works only if you put it at, uh, on, on the lower back, or lower half. Yes? Yeah. That's something you can try. You know, in many engines, you do that. You tune the acoustics to the combustion to increase the speed. But here, at this stage, we were only trying to close the valves fast enough so that we can avoid any leaks when we do the combustion phase. And uh, we didn't go to the point where we, uh, I will show you, actually, it doesn't work really well. We didn't go to the point where we try to tune these things. But yeah, if you would do that industrially, you would try to tune the acoustic mode to the, to the, the time it takes to, for, for combustion to increase the speed. When you do LES, you take into account any perturbation, big or small. When you do acoustic codes, you only talk about the linear part, so it has to be small. Small for acoustics means, you know, it can still be, you know, 100 Pascal is small for acoustics compared to 10,000. Okay, th now you, you're asking another question that everything I've talked about is related to what we call the FTF, the flame transfer function. Nowadays, people also talk about FDF, flame describing function, which is a function of the amplitude. And we know that uh, uh, at high amplitude, the delay will change. 
But when you do it, you know, the idea with, linear, with commercial instabilities is that normally they start small. So it's, you start by writing a linear model. Because when they are big, it's usually too late. So usually people try to write a model which works in the linear regime, because normally that's the moment where you should find a way to avoid that. But when it goes to large values, you know, I mentioned that just maybe two days ago, in the Apollo engine, uh, the F1 engine, the mean pressure was 80 bars, and the P prime was 60. I mean, this thing was, the pressure was going crazy. Now it's not linear, and then you have to, these tools will not work if you go to this type of uh, instabilities. It would be too much. But we already have a hard time doing it in, in the linear regime, okay? This is why we, we don't go to the non-linear regime. Uh, another, another question about uh, what we said? Nope, so we take a coffee, come back in 10 minutes. Don't want to miss the banquet, huh? <laughs>
without wasting the message, I'm going to show you that the important thing is the velocity at the place where you ignite. If the velocity at the place of the spark in a given cycle is too large, it's not going to ignite, or let's say it's going to ignite very slowly. If the velocity is too slow, uh, well, then no problem, combustion will be able to develop. So here we look at the velocity uh, in the combustion chamber, and uh, you see that every cycle, again, is different, okay? And uh, when you look at a lot of cycles, you see a dispersion of the velocity, which tells you that all these cycles, they look the same, but if you look at the velocity field, it's not the same. So this is cycle after cycle, and it is the maximum pressure. So if the maximum pressure is about one bar, it means there was no combustion, and if the maximum pressure is large, it means this cycle has been burning. This is only uh, LES data. So you see there are two groups of cycles. Okay. <laughs> I will finish this talk tomorrow after converting it to a uh, keynote. I think this is just too much now. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me switch to the next one, actually, because uh, this PowerPoint guy is a pain in the neck. So since he doesn't want to, I'm going to switch to ignition. Okay, this one will work because it's keynote. Okay, sorry about that. I uh, will finish the other one tomorrow if I can, but you get the main message anyway. Uh, the next topic I wanted to discuss is ignition. Whenever you have a flame, you know, if you cannot ignite it, you're in bad shape. So controlling ignition is a big topic everywhere in combustion. It's also a big topic for combustion science. Actually, auto-ignition is what uh, Alison Tomlin is doing all the time. I talked about that you know, in the first days. You take uh, an homogeneous reactor, no stratification of anything. You let it for a certain time. And then you go to ignition, auto-ignition, no spark needed. But this happens only in a limited number of devices. Diesel engines are, for example, auto-ignited. But most uh, classical engines, you need a spark to ignite them, a spark or something else. So the spark model has also been one of the big classic in combustion. The spark model can be done uh, usually already in a laminar flow using a laser or a spark. Uh, that leads to the same thing. It leads to a sphere of burn gases which is growing. And you remember we talked about that already with uh, Moshe also. This thing grows at a speed which is not the laminar flame speed. It's the laminar flame speed multiplied by the density ratio. And uh, studying that is a big issue in the, in the community. Now, the, the, the difficult thing uh, about uh, uh, ignition is to, to realize that during the initial instance of ignition, there are things happening that you don't want to know about, okay? The temperature goes to 10,000 K, the gas goes to a plasma. Uh, there are things which are extremely complex, but the nice thing about it is that if you come back, you close your eyes, and you come back a few microseconds later, what's left after this phase is like a bowl of uh, very hot gases. And this is where the combustion people start you know, working. And this ball is created here in this zone. And we'll talk about that at the end of the talk. But basically, we start here by assuming that what the spark is doing is to create a small sphere of burned gases. And the question is, is this sufficient to ignite a flame or not? And we know it's not always sufficient. So you start, and there's a big bunch of, uh, of uh, theoretical papers on that to work on what we call MIE minimum ignition energies. How much energy do you have to put there so that flames can begin? Otherwise, of course, it won't work. The, the, first, you know, the, the first things are quite uh, simple. I mean, the first thing that you do, you say, if I want to begin a flame, I should have, if the flame thickness is delta, the minimum I can do is to have two delta in a sphere so that I have two flames back to back, you know, so that when they start, they are not affected by the fact that the other guy is not burning enough. So you should deposit at least a sphere which has a size of two delta, and it should at least be uh, warmer than the ignition temperature. And usually we say that the ignition temperature is close to the adiabatic flame temperature. So you can write a very simple model for the MIE, which is the following. You say, let's take a sphere of uh, radius delta, diameter two delta. Its volume is that. 
uh, I need to bring it from T1 before my spark or before my laser to T2. And usually, you know, we say we take the ignition temperature to be the adiabatic flame temperature. Again, theoreticians, you have seen that, you know, that the maximum uh, temperature, the maximum reaction rate is reached for a temperature which is pretty close to the adiabatic flame temperature. So let's say it's T2. So you plug that, the numbers here, you know, at one bar and 300K, and you find one millijoule. Now you might say, okay, what is the energy of a spark? Usually, well, it's more like 20 or 30. The problem is that the energy that you send to the spark does not necessarily go straight to the gas. Now, uh, this, this is a computation, you know, uh, done in a very, uh, in a very uh, approximative way. Uh, you can talk to a, a champion, actually, or people of the same uh, type, like Matalon, actually, also. And you can do an asymptotic analysis. And when you do the full asymptotic analysis, you find something which is written like this. But uh, when you use TB equal to T add, this is very close to RC equal uh, the, flame the flame thickness. So the asymptotic analysis would be better, but it will give you the same order of magnitude, one millijoule for most flames. Now, if you plot an experiment in which you put here the amount of methane and here the minimum ignition energy that you need to spark, you see that you find three millijoules here, and uh, it's going up if you are very lean or very rich, as expected. Huh? Uh, uh, and uh, if you go beyond the flammability limits, you cannot ignite. Now, there are very funny flames. I don't know if uh, Moshe will talk about that. They are f you remember that a premix flame has a rich flammability limit and a lean flammability limit. The lean flammability limit and the rich flammability limits are not necessarily equal to the rich ignition limit and the lean ignition limit. They are flames which propagate, but which cannot be uh, ignited, and vice versa. So that makes life a little bit complicated. But those are exotic animals. Uh, for us, you know, in practice, if you're too rich or too lean, you cannot ignite and you cannot propagate. Uh, of course, this is in a laminar flow. When you put that in a turbulent flow, things get more complicated, much more complicated. We'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Now, there are cases where you don't need the spark. Okay? If you're using diesel, everything relies on the auto-ignition of the fuel, in which case you don't control that, but uh, you control it by the fact that as long as you don't inject, there is no ignition, and when you inject, ignition can start. So you control the ignition by injecting di directly into the chamber. Remember that for most engines using gasoline, uh, the injection is not done here. The injection is done upstream, and that's the main difference between a gasoline engine and a diesel. You could not operate a diesel by injecting here. You have to inject in the chamber to control the, the, the auto-ignition time. Now, in a piston engine, you ignite at every cycle. In a gas turbine, you ignite only when you start the engine, if you, if you don't have problems. And so uh, there are two big fields for people studying ignition and combustion. One, of the, one part of the, these guys are trying to make sure that you ignite. And the other side, people working on safety, and we'll talk about safety for hydrogen tomorrow, you try to make sure it does not ignite. Not igniting is important. A few years ago, I met a guy working for nuclear bombs. His job was to make sure they don't ignite. I think it's a good idea. And he was unsure. I mean, I just uh, was saying, you know, what happens if you drop the bomb? What happens if you shoot on the bomb? What happens if it's too hot? Or what? It's frightening. You know, just okay. It's another topic. So ignition of the gas turbine. The first thing to say about ignition is that ignition is not really ignition, it's an ignition sequence. It's a long process by which you, know, you, you start rotating the engine, you start injecting the fuel, you ignite one burner or two sometimes, and then the, everyone must ignite, and then the whole engine goes up in power, and then you, know, you can uh, start to ignite. So you ignite one, one engine, you see here, on this side, and then you get what you call the, the light around where all flames will ignite, and then they, those flames are not ignited by a spark. They're ignited because their neighbor is ignited. So the, the flame keeps going, which is another very interesting combustion problem. Uh, 
you may also be able to ignite a system but not be able to stabilize it. I will show you a few examples. Uh, that's because the chamber, uh, the, the spark may not be at the right place. And we'll have examples of that too. Uh, there are cases where you may want to uh, make sure that you ignite by adding something. One of the big uh, a la mode uh, methodology today is plasma. And uh, you can use plasma to guarantee that the flame will not only ignite, but also stabilize and stay there. That's a movie, uh, if it wants to work, by uh, Christophe Lowe, again in Paris. I'm doing a lot of publicity for Paris these days. Uh, so you will see this flame here, and at the bottom of the flame here, they can create a plasma, a small plasma between this point and this point. This is a diffusion flame, and you see here, for the moment, it's burning quite well. But if you make it leaner and leaner, without plasma, you diffuse the temperature as expected. When the flame gets too lean, it starts having problems. It wants to quench. You see at the bottom here, it starts, you know, shaking. Now you close to quenching. You can see it quenches actually from time to time. Up, up, up. And now they put the plasma on, and of course here you see that the plasma at the bottom of the flame here acts like a continuous ignition. So it's not a spark, it's always there. It's actually pulsating at very high frequency, but the overall result is that by putting plasma at the bottom of the flame, you allow it to, to keep stable. So you basically ignite it on a continuous basis, not from time to time. Now, I just want to show you this movie. Okay, I'm going to play it two times. It's a little bit uh, uh, complicated. It's a 1D computation in a premix gas where you put a spark here, and the spark ignites two flame fronts, one going right, one going left. And uh, you will see how this process of ignition takes place. It's actually not that simple. Here, we don't care about the initial plasma phase. All the ignition is replaced by the fact that we deposit energy. It's a source term in the energy equation. It's not more than that. So as time goes by, the first thing you see here is the spark. The spark disappears. The temperature has gone up enough for the heat release to start peaking. And then you create two flame fronts. And you see that the temperature now is higher here than the adiabatic flame temperature because it remembers the spark. You added energy initially. You see also that the profiles of temperature are not yet what they're going to be later. That means you don't have the preheat zone and the reaction zone. All of that has been uh, modified by the fact that you threw energy into the system initially. Look at the spark here. The blue zone here, you put a lot of energy, then you stop, but that's enough. You have a shock wave or an acoustic wave propagating on both sides here. And then after that, you get ignition. And you see that the whole thing takes time. If you blow on this guy, because there's a high speed in this flow, you might actually interrupt it uh, and just lead to quenching. So it's a, it's a moment where the flame can be killed easily because it is so small. OK, now let me show you this one. This one is a, 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 a turbulent flame. And you will see two things. You will see first how it's working when it's operating. And then we will stop it and ignite it. And we will ignite it. There is a spark located here at the top. And you will see that that's also a main problem, exactly like commercial instabilities, is that it's not a case where you can see, I ignite it, and it gets ignited. No. You ignite it, it doesn't work. You ignite it, it doesn't work. And you will see at the fifth spark, suddenly, poof, it goes. So again, because it's turbulent, it's not always the same. And that's a major problem for us, because we need to repeat those things. <laughs> And now we're going to ignite it with the spark which is on top. That's the air. That's you. And the blah 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 blah, blah is the spark. This chamber is probably a little bit unstable, as you can. That's okay. So you see, again, uh, it, it will take quite a few spark events before you can ignite, which is going to be a problem in industry for obvious uh, reasons. 
So in the turbulent flow, once you know that it's difficult to ignite, the question of industry is, what's the best place to put the spark? And today, actually, uh, sparks can be put only near walls. So what we plan to do, and uh, some people are already doing it, is to use a laser to ignite so that you can shoot anywhere in the chamber. There must be places, you know, which are better to ignite. Uh, if you ignite in the middle of a high-speed flow, you know it's going to be difficult. If you ignite in a place where there is no fuel, it's going to be difficult. So we do what we call uh, ignition probability maps so that we can use them afterwards to, to, to know where to put the spark uh, ignition. Let me show you an example here. This is another burner here in France where you inject uh, fuel and air here. You have a swirler, and here you have the combustion chamber. This is the exhaust. And uh, in this chamber, when you look at the ignition probability, you see that uh, when the red here uh, means that if you ignite here, it will ignite. And if it's blue, if you ignite here, it will not ignite. So clearly, there is an issue here of uh, where you're going to locate your spark. So I'm just going to show you three LES here. The, the, we have mixed the first map was experimental. This one is LES. So there is a spark here or here or here. And you're going to see the difference uh, between these three cases. So the first case, you put a spark here and you ignite. You see that you have a kernel which grows. It is kind of protected from the mean flow. And it grows enough that when it interacts with the chamber, it's able to invade the whole chamber. So this would be a successful ignition. Now, if you put the spark just a few centimeters downstream, uh, that's not the same story here. You have a kernel, but it's not growing fast enough, and it's shred by turbulence. And if you continue simulation, it would completely die. So again, it shows you that finding the right place for ignition is a big issue for combustor. Now, we've put the spark in the middle of the recirculation zone here. And this is not a bad place for ignition. It's a quiet place, so the flame is able to grow and finally invade the whole chamber. So you see that uh, uh, in a chamber, finding the right position for ignition is a major problem. So of course, there are cases where all other criteria for combustion efficiency are satisfied, and you have a problem because you cannot ignite it. That's a major problem. Um, and uh, it becomes a critical problem for relight of aircraft or for ignition of a helicopter, for example, because uh, those conditions are mandatory. And on an aircraft, if you lose the engines at 10,000 meters, you must be able to restart them before you reach the ground for obvious reasons. And that imposes a constraint on the size of the chamber, which is extremely strong. It's actually the first criterion uh, when you design a chamber, it must reignite at a high altitude where you don't have a lot of air and where it's cold and it's a, it's, it's a complicated problem. OK, let me, let me uh, also mention what we call violent. You all know what, vi well, maybe not you are too young. Uh, my generation, we had gas oven. You know, uh, you, would cake, you would cook your cakes in a gas oven. The gas oven, the joke was always the same. You, know? you would open the gas. And there was a lighter. You know, you would try to ignite; it would not ignite. You would try to ignite; it would not ignite. And then suddenly, you have no eyebrows and no air, because <laughs> this time it ignited. Okay, that's what we call a violent ignition. It can happen in an engine. In an engine, like rocket engines, if during the ignition sequence you start filling the chamber with gas that did not ignite, ultimately it will ignite. But then you will blow up the chamber. That's what we call violent ignition with hydrogen. It is a key problem that we're going to face. I will talk about that uh, tomorrow. And of course, uh, the, the, the other very violent ignition is safety. If you accumulate gas and air in a building and you have ignition, uh, you, have, uh, you're going, you might actually go to detonation. We said that already. So those are cases where ignition uh, leads to, to, to very uh, violent uh, situations. Um, we will also see cases, I mentioned them already, where you ignite, you create the first kernel, but you didn't put it at the right place. So this kernel grows and go away. So that's not go. I mean, good. We need to put the spark at a place where we reach stabilization. Igniting and stabilizing is not the same thing. Okay? You can have ignition and then maybe not stabilize. That depends where you put your spark. So we're going to talk about five different configurations, depending on how much time we have. I will talk first about a very uh, basic prototype. 
for, for fundamental studies, but also for safety. It's uh, a tube, and someone has punched a hole there, and you have a jet of gas mixing with air. Uh, and there's someone around uh, smoking or, I don't know, doing something. And the question is, will it ignite or not? Okay, this is how you design the safety regulations. For example, if you have a big pipeline of gas somewhere, you need to tell the people you cannot build a house at less than, you know, 10, 100 meters, whatever. So this is a problem which can be, from the fundamental point of view, summarized as here, a jet of hot gases into of, coal, of fuel uh, gases in the air and a spark somewhere, ignition or not, no ignition. Then we look at a, a gas turbine ignition, and here you will see that the, the, the problem is really that uh, you need not only to ignite one burner, but you need to ignite everyone, and that's not so easy. Then we talk a little bit about rocket engines to talk about violent ignitions, those which can destroy the engines. And then we'll talk a little bit about safety, and at the end we may talk about uh, the spark itself. So let's start with the jet. So here, uh, the configuration is quite simple. You have a tube with a turbulent jet. What you see here is uh, the equivalence ratio for the cold flow. So of course it's pretty high in the jet, and it's zero outside. Uh, the experiment here was done at, uh, at Cambridge by uh, Master Akos, uh, and uh, we did the simulation here in Toulouse. So uh, you're going to see cases where we put the spark as an energy deposition at different places. So as I said, if you are in the safety business, you want to make sure you don't ignite. If you are the engine business, you want to be sure you ignite. So in our cases, we, we looked at all cases. So we know that if you are too far away, there's no fuel here, so you can spark. No, it's not dangerous. Uh, if you are too downstream also, it's the same thing. There may be some fuel, but it's so lean that the flame speed is too small, or even you are below flammability limits, and then you have no problem. Now, you say, okay, I need a lot of fuel. Well, ex except that here, if you're in the middle here, uh, the flow speed is too large. So even if you ignite, you're going to bl blow enough to the right side. So there's not such a big zone where you can hope to get ignition, okay? So uh, I'm going to show you a position here, here, and here, and you're going to see the difference in the simulation. So first case, we ignite very close here to the injection. You see the temperature field, and you see that this flame is lifted. We talked about lifted flame yesterday, but it's stable. So this is a case where you ignite and you get a stable flame. So here you get ignition and stabilization. Now let me show you a case where you ignite too far away. So you have ignition, but you have no stabilization. Why? It's because here, again, we'll talk about triple flames. Uh, the triple flame speed's too low. Here, there's no stoichiometric zone anymore. So this zone is burning, but it cannot come back here. Okay. And the last case is a case where we do have the experiments, actually. Uh, you have the experimental data here. You have the simulation. And this is just the limit where the flame, you see, it's hesitating. And then finally saying, OK, fine. OK, I can propagate against the flow. My triple flame speed is enough and I'm moving around, and I'm going to go back to the normal stabilization point. So you see here the variety of situations that you can have when you put a spark on such a simple uh, configuration. Uh, let me jump that. So let's go now to uh, two-phase flow combustion, swirl flows, let's say, more complicated uh, situation. So I'm going to talk about the gas turbine case. In the, in, the, in the real life of gas turbines, they have multiple injectors, multiple burners. If you go to Siemens, you're going to have 24 of these guys. Uh, that's probably the maximum. And most other chambers will have between 10 and, and uh, 16. The, you don't put an, uh, uh, an igniting system on all of them. You hope that uh, when you ignite one, it will ignite the other. So usually, like always in industry, you say, I need only one to ignite. So for safety, I put two. Okay, One here, one here just to be sure that we, if one of them fails, the other one will work. So here in a system like the Siemens system, you can see the, the burner and uh, the ignition devices are located here. And you want to be sure you ignite. So this is a view of the phases of ignition here. This is a turbomeca or Safran helicopter engine case here. The first phase is that you need to ignite the first burner. So here you see there are two sparks which are operated at the same time, and you are able to ignite two of these burners. 
but those are not ignited. Okay? Then there's a second phase where you wait until these things ignite. Okay, all of them. That can take a certain time. And then, once everyone is ignited, you can stop the special injection you had here, and then the whole chamber is ignited. And you see, this process has to work uh, on the ground, but also at 5,000 meters. And if it doesn't work, you're dead. I mean, it's just uh, you cannot sell your your your. Aircraft. Now, another kitchen test of uh, Thierry Poisson. Uh, you, you don't need an aircraft to do that, okay? Even at home. Um, uh, especially in the U.S., you have these pilot flames in the middle, and you see now you ignite one part, and the whole question is, how can the flame go around and ignite everything? For this thing, it works quite well, as you can see here. And then you ignite everything. So you see that with one igniter, you can ignite all flames. So it's not only when you call it ignition, it's the ignition of the first flame, and once this flame is ignited, we call it ignition, but it's actually propagation to the other flames. Globally, industry calls that the global uh, ignition process. And of course, if you ignite only half of the burners, it's lost. Okay? You have to ignite everyone. So we're going to, 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 to look at that in a gas turbine configuration, uh, which is a, a real engine. And uh, the, the way it works is the following. Okay? Normally, you put the the injectors here, so here you inject air and kerosene, here you inject air and kerosene, and in the middle here, you usually have another burner, that is why it gets complicated, which creates a, a zone of hot gases. So you inject a big amount of burn gases in the middle here. But note that here, there is no fuel. The fuel is injected here and there. So the question is, to have combustion, remember you need fuel and air and a high temperature. For the moment, they are separated. You have the air and the fuel here. You have the flame here. You would tell me, why don't you inject the hot gases here? Just because technically it's impossible. You know, you, they have to do it this way for technical reasons that we cannot change. So uh, we're going to do a simulation first by assuming that we are quite rich and we are able to have one igniter for each uh, sector which never happens. It's the most favorable situation. But that's from a CFD point of view. It allows us to say that the system is periodic. Okay? We can take only uh, one pattern, and we know it's going to be repeated. So that's convenient for, for, the, for the simulation. That really means that we, we, we believe that in the real engine, we would have this situation. One swirler, one igniter, one swirler, one igniter, etc. So the simulation then can be done in the periodic domain. You will see here the injection of air and kerosene. And here you will see the injection of hot gases. You know, intuition is not always helpful here. Of course, uh, if you don't want ignition, you wouldn't do that. You, know, you would not inject kerosene and air and hot gases. You feel it's going to ignite. But actually, you will see it, it's not igniting. In a case like this, uh, you have a hot air flowing in. But, you know, this guy doesn't care. OK, fine, there is hot air a few centimeters away from me, but uh, I'm, I'm not concerned. Um, at the place where I have air and fuel here, nothing is hot, so I don't ignite. It's actually a situation which, uh, which you've seen in other uh, situations. Um, it's, it's a problem which is well known for um, uh, military aircraft, supersonic bombers, because all these guys have um, very, they use post-combustion, like the Concorde, you know, and so they have jets of burn gases here, like the jets of burn gases I'm using to ignite uh, the chamber, and they can have kerosene losses, you know. So here you see it's exactly the same thing. You have air and kerosene and burn gases. Will it ignite or not? For the Concorde, uh, we have at least, you know, four or five, one, my, my colleague, actually, Denis Venant, was on the, the board who studied this thing. We have pictures of flames ignited here, small flames ignited here, many times before the last accident. Uh, but they were small flames, and they would disappear afterwards. Now, these times, of course, because the, we, you never know where the, the, the loss of kerosene will occur, they were too close to the burn gases. And so the burn gases were able to ignite the kerosene flow, and then once, once the flame is anchored, it's the end of the, of the plane. So here, you can do the same thing. You can increase now 
the amount of burn gases that you inject. And because of turbulence, some of these hot gases come here. They start heating the kerosene in the air. And then combustion eventually will start, as you will see in a second. OK, now you see combustion is beginning. You start having hot gases in the middle. And now suddenly you have reaction weight here. And now the flame is stabilized in front of this thing. You can even stop now the, the injection of hot gases because this guy is going to self-sustain. And so you see that there's also the notion not of a minimum ignition energy, but at least a minimum flux of hot gases to be able to, to stabilize a, a flame like this. Uh, so this is another view here where the blue here is the high speed and the red is the temperature. So you see the jets here of hot gases. And here you see the injector of air and kerosene. And you will see at some point that this guy says, OK, uh, I'm going to come here and I'm going to ignite you. Takes a while. Up. Now it's starting. And now you've got ignition. And of course, the engineers would like this thing to be as fast as possible and as reliable as possible. So that's how you would ignite one sector. So in this case, it tells you that you must be sure that your igniters are strong enough and provide enough hot gases so that you're sure that uh, combustion will really proceed. Remember also that when you do that, it costs you a lot. Okay? The batteries, for the moment, are rotating the engine. You can do that only for a few seconds. After that, the batteries are dead. So the combustion has to take over rapidly. You cannot wait uh, too long. OK, so now the, the, the problem is, uh, what happens now for the neighbors? So here, for the neighbors, unfortunately, if you want to know what happens, you need to do a 360 computation. Very few groups in the world actually to do, do that. I think you don't need a hand to count them, probably two or three. So you need to do a 360 computation by putting, for example, here we put two injectors, one here and one there, and we look at the global propagation. And you will see that it's actually uh, it's fun. So now we really have only two injectors. We activate both of them together. And this is what you find. This is the geometry. This simulation uh, was also, I don't know, probably 10 million CPU hours uh, to, to, to do. So you see here, the, the blue is the velocity. The red is the hot jet. So you see that and the yellow is the reaction rate. You see that these first two ignite, and then somehow the flame jumps to the next one, and to the next one, and to the next one, until it meets the other flames coming from the other side. Okay? And at the end, everyone is ignited, and it takes about 25 milliseconds, okay? which is quite short. Okay, for now. That's reasonable for them. I mean, that's, that's what they're, they're happy with that, because this is atmospheric pressure. Uh, so it's another view of the, same, of the same computation here, where you start uh, at the top here. You can see the flame front, and you can see the propagation. And one of the big questions for, for us was, what's the mechanism which allows flame to actually jump to the other? And you will see that you will recognize someone we discussed yesterday. You might think that uh, it's because the neighbor is ignited here. This is hot, but that's not the reason. You will see in a minute why this flame is able to jump from one burner to another. You can do the same thing with two-phase flow. Here, it, this is done with a kerosene injection, but the mechanism is about the same. You ignite locally, and then you jump to the neighbors, at least for these conditions. Sometimes at high altitude, it's more difficult. Now, once you get the movie, like always, you ask the student, well, OK, it's nice, but what else can we say about that? Uh, well, we can look at the mechanisms here. This is now the same engine, but you put it on the plane. OK, so you start the two. You see the two sparks here, the two jets, let's say. And then you see the flame growing and then finally merging. So this is time. So you see the whole process here. And what you can do is to ask yourself, who is leading here? Who, what's happening at this point here, which seems to be the first one propagating? So what's special about this point? So you can, uh, you can measure its velocity just by post-processing the LES data and see the speed at which this guy is moving. We call that the leading point. And if you plot the leading points, you're actually going to track this point here. This is temperature. And now we're going to travel with 
the leading point. So you can see there's a one leading point downstream and one leading point upstream close to the burner. This one is the fastest one. And now we're going around with the flame, okay? We are tracking the flame. It's only a month of PhD to do the movie. <laughs> we loved it. I mean, it's fun. Huh? It's just, uh, you could do it better today with, uh, with uh, more uh, sophisticated graphic tools. So this is the result of the leading point that we just saw in the movie. The leading point starts from, uh, from here, where you have the hot jet. Here, there is no hot jet, okay? So this leading point is traveling all over the chamber until it reaches this point at, uh, after 24 milliseconds. So now that you have the trajectory, you can compute the speed. And the speed, uh, that's where things get interesting. Remember, this is kerosene at one bar. Flame speed is 40 centimeters per second. So what's the speed of this thing? Well, actually, when you plot it versus time, this is what you find. This is about 20 meters per second. So now what you say, oh, wait, wait a second, what's going on? Why? Why is this guy going so fast? Well, there are many explanations. You could say there's a swirling motion, but it's not fast enough. Uh, there is turbulence. We've seen that turbulence does increase the flame speed, but again, not from half a meter to 20. That's really a lot. And actually, everything is due to dilatation. Dilatation, something we've been teaching with Moshe uh, for the last few days. And again, you go back to theory. We know that when you ignite something, the speed of propagation of the front is the displacement speed. It's not the flame speed. It's the flame speed multiplied by a factor of six to eight. And so it's not only turbulence which makes this thing propagate, it's really dilatation. Which really means here that in this flame, of course it's difficult to see because it's 3D, but uh, imagine now that uh, if you would take this flame here and you would block here, the passage of the gases, they would have to dilate in this direction, okay? So the dilatation in this direction would be much more. And that's what's happening here. Here you have walls on the top wall and the lower wall, so the only place to go for the flame is either outside or to the lateral part, okay? So this explains the speed at which this thing is actually invading the whole system. And one way to make it even faster would be to shrink the outlet, okay? But if you open it too much, then you know that the flame is uh, going to slow down in terms of uh, propagation. So this is, again, an example where you see that theory helps you to understand what the simulations are doing. Otherwise, you, you're stuck. You know, you might say, oh, okay, why, why, why do we have such a big speed? Okay, so as you see here, the, 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 the propagation was driven by dilatation. Uh, is this always the case? Well, you have a... Other, other, other problem, the, if you want to look at the details, you have to give up this big engine. You have to go back to the lab where you have measurements. So I want to show you two, uh, two examples of very nice uh, experiments which were done uh, uh, at Coria in Rouen and at Ecole Centrale in Paris. One of the questions of uh, Safran and all these guys is the following one. You look at these annular chambers. They have from 10 to 24 injectors. Why? Why so many? Uh, well, the first thing the engineers will tell you, we'd like to have less, but we are not sure that the flame will actually jump from one to the other, okay? They say, if we don't put enough here, we are afraid that we're going to ignite this one, and this one here will not ignite. So the first criterion when you put injectors is, are you sure you're going to be igniting all of them without adding sparks? And uh, to do that, uh, well, you know, if you put too many injectors, it costs you a lot. You need to feed them, you need etc. Uh, so the idea is to check what is the distance you need between two injectors before the flame stops jumping from one burner to the other. And this is why this engine, this uh, bench was designed here. This is a CH4 air injector with five injectors. They ignite it, you will see at some point, and you will see how the flame jumps to the others. So the simulation was done in Rouen, and uh, the simulation was done in, in Toulouse and uh, the, the, the experiment in Rouen. And they were able to do three cases, uh, changing the number of injectors, and you're going to see now how it works. So this is the experiment. You ignite here. This is the first, the beginning of the combustion. So you see now that when you have five injectors, the flame jumps right away to the next one, then to this one, then to that one, and then to this one. Actually, it's funny because this one ignites before this one. And then you have a fully established combustion system, okay? 
Now, if you do the, the simulation of that, that's what you find. Of course, in the simulation, you can look at the flame from any place. So here we're going to look at the top view, and here are the side view. So you put the spark at the same place, and you look at its propagation. Now, from the top, you see what it's doing. Because there is swirl, the flame goes around here. So it reaches faster here than here, then invades this part, and then this part. And you see that basically for this flame, when you have five injectors, you're good. I mean, it always ignites. You start it somewhere, and everything gets burnt and ignited after a short time. And then, of course, you, you go to steady state, and you find you know, what, you, what you expect. So you see that uh, that's what we call a good propagation because the, the flame jumps from one burner to the other with, uh, I would say, easiness. Now, um, this is what we want. We want the flame to propagate to the neighbor by this zone, not because you, know, you would have a propagation like this one where you would actually uh, have to slowly fill the chamber and finally go to stabilization, which is what happens for what we call 26 here. Here you see what I just showed you, five injectors. But at the right-hand side, you see that when you have a very long distance between the two, this guy ignites because it has a spark. But you know, it takes forever. Now it's finished here. It's still going on here. And you see this thing is still not ignited. It's taking forever. And finally, when the whole chamber gets filled, oh, now it's igniting. So that's not good. Okay. So it really tells you that uh, this separation is OK. This one is not OK. And you can use simulation and experiments to, to understand that. You can actually plot you know, the distances uh, uh, in the injector and see that at some point you go into, into, into problems when you put too many. Now, you can also do something. There are not that many uh, experiments like this. There are quite maybe one in China, one in Norway, one in Cambridge, one in Paris. I don't know in the, of the States. Actually. Probably is one in the States too. It's a transparent uh, annular rig. Okay, so it's quite nice. You can see it here. You have quartz window. If you break one, you lose the salary of one year. It's a, uh, expensive games. And you have injectors. And you have a spark here that you can see. And here, unlike the engine, you can compare the experiment and the simulation, which is always a bad idea. But sometimes you have to do it. Uh, so here, you're going to see. Uh, 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 first example where you ignite on the right side, this is the experiment. And you will recognize the shape in a second. You see the flame is propagating here to the outlet and also to the side because of dilatation, as I said. And you see now you invade the whole chamber. Now, the funny thing about that is that every time we have a PhD student doing only CFD, we bring him here after six months because when this thing ignites, there's a lot of mixed gases around, and usually the guy thinks he's going to die because it makes a huge noise. There's a big boom when you ignite these guys. You can see here, actually. It's kind of an impressive experiment. You see the, the, the power is only 40 here. It's still not big for experimental, but uh, it's already quite noisy. So you can do the simulation here, and you see the, the simulation on top and uh, the experiment at the bottom, and you look at the speed of propagation. and uh, the turbulent combustion model does its job here, and you get something quite reasonable in terms of, uh, of comparison. Here. Now, I must say that this is actually the easy part of the job, because the difficult part of the job would be to decrease the pressure and the temperature until this thing stops. We know that it stops. We know that when you are too high and too cold, the propagation stops because you know, flame speeds are less, etc. We didn't do that yet. I think that, that, that the experiment, of course, is quite difficult. You would have to go to depressurize the um, bench to, to do it. The simulation would be easier. So let me talk a little bit about rocket engines. Those are very uh, strange animals here. Uh, this is not a real rocket engine. It's, uh, it's a bench installed in, in Germany. Uh, where you actually inject O2 and H2 in a chamber which looks like an engine. And it has this specific feature of rocket engines is that they are terminated by a nozzle. So there's not much place to expand, which means the pressure will go up. And if the pressure goes up too much, you might blow up the whole system. That's not a good idea. So we are simulating what's happening here. And the important thing about rocket engines is to realize that you don't ignite them. You have to be careful about how you do that. You have a long ignition sequence. You start by purging everything 
with nitrogen, don't want anything left. Then after that, you start injecting H2 for a certain time. Then you start injecting O2, and then at some point you ignite. Okay, and if you don't do it in the right way, here you blow up the engine. Okay, so uh, and the pressure will actually go up here, as you can see in the experiment, goes up from one bar to about 11, but you shouldn't go too high. So uh, this overpressure is the dangerous part of the game, of course. So. For LES, uh, since we talked a bit about CFD before, it's uh, painful to do that because the ignition phase is fast, but the, the purging phases are long, and LES doesn't like it when it's too long. You know, with LES, you don't compute five seconds. You don't even compute one second. When you compute 0.1 second, remember the time step is 10 nanoseconds. So when you have computed 0.1 second, you are you already uh, have burned a lot of CPU time. So we had to find ways to do that that I don't want to describe here. There are ways to do that by speeding up the computation. This is the computation domain. Again, you mesh the atmosphere so you don't have to worry about the boundary conditions. And uh, you put the resolution here where you put the spark and you can run the, this simulation. So you have the spark here. It's ignited by your laser. That's the velocity field and you will see the, the pressure and the... the, the Reaction rate here on this plot. So you see temperature goes up. There's a lot of combustion near the walls. That's also something which is normal, like in piston engines, when you are in a confined volume, a lot of the combustion takes place near the walls. I won't talk about wall combustion before tomorrow, uh, but that's another issue for modeling. And you see that uh, the total pressure you find in the LES is quite reasonable and comparable to what we have when we compare the LES and the experiment, it, it gives you a fair idea of what's going on. So you can use LES then to predict uh, if you will have a violent ignition or not. Again, remember, this is a rocket engine. You cannot do that. This would be too high. In, a, in an H2 gas turbine, for example, it would probably explode the engine. This is a view of the flame. You know, when you start here with the ignition after 2250 microseconds, this is the LES here, and you see the experiment. You see quite a reasonable... Uh, uh, comparison. Okay, let's start talking a little bit about uh, ignition in a less uh, pleasant uh, mode. Uh, you know that uh, safety, actually, so I think this question was raised yesterday. Even if we don't do flames, you know, other people do flames, fires and explosions are the two big topics for the community working on these issues. Uh, now, this is a very famous uh, uh, explosion, but most of them do the same thing. You have locally an explosion on an industrial site, and then this explosion is followed by a fire. And then uh, you can imagine the consequences of this thing. So, uh, Bunsfield is probably the most famous one. We believe in Bunsfield there was an explosion due to an interaction between the flames and the trees which were outside. There was a leak of gas outside here. And so there was first a detonation, and after that, uh, everything started burning for a while. You can imagine the, the, the consequences. I've shown you already the difference between a detonation and a deflagration. Just another picture. As you can see that, this is a deflagration because the building is still there. And the one on the right side is a, a deflagration. <laughs> to remind you that what we call the overpressure must be small if you want to survive. Probably half a bar is the maximum in this building. With well, detonation, you go to 50 bars, so there's no question about what will be left. I mean, it will be nothing. So this is how you make weapons, okay? So we want to avoid that. Uh, the way you do that is actually coming back to a very fundamental problem of turbulent combustion. You have a box. We call it usually a venting chamber. The, the literature is full of venting chambers. Uh, in these venting chambers, you put obstacles. I will remind you in a minute why. Uh, uh, and all kinds of obstacles, which will generate turbulence. And then you ignite, and then you look at the result. From a point of view of a turbulent combustion modeler, it's an interesting case because the boundary conditions are well known, and the initial conditions are clear. There is no flow. So when you start your computation, it's very clean. U equals zero everywhere. Ignite and compare. And so you find in the literature multiple vaulting chambers, and uh, being able to predict ignition and flame propagation there and over pressure on the walls is, of course, a key, a key question. Why do we do that? Why well, we do it? Because we are paid to do it, and because 
Uh, it's very interesting for turbulent combustion models because, as I said, if you have to compute a gas turbines, before you go to the point where you discuss turbulent combustion, you have to worry about all kinds of complicated geometries and uh, fuel injection and all that, and it's complicated. While here, as I said, the initial conditions are quite simple. You put U equals zero everywhere, you have the geometry. So it's a very clean, at least when you begin to look at it, it looks like a very clean case to compute. Unfortunately, it's, it's a little bit more complicated in practice. So uh, I'm going to talk about a, a very famous one, which is the Masri uh, setup in Sydney, uh, which has been very well documented. And uh, the key problem here is that uh, we're going to go back to this Reynolds number discussion we had yesterday, is that uh, this is a box which is like big like this. Okay, So it's a small Reynolds number somehow. And uh, we're going to tune our models on that one. And so how do you do that? Well, you know, Masri did a lot of experiments by putting just one obstacle in the chamber, then one obstacle plus one grid, then two grids, then three grids. So we have a lot of cases where you can check if your model is actually doing the right thing. And uh, they ignite with a laser at, and, at this point. <laughs> the thing that we did that we should never have done was to ask the following questions. We have, you're going to see that for the small chamber here, we did really well. I mean, that we capture everything. So then someone stupid said, oh, okay, what if we make the size larger? So we, we, we were working with Total, actually. As you know, Total is an oil company, so money has no importance for them. So they said, okay, no problem. Let's make it six times bigger, and let's make it even 25 bigger, and go to Gexcon, which is a Norway, I think Norway company, and uh, let's do it. So we multiplied this guy by 24, and exactly the same shape, same thing, same everything, except the Reynolds number is much larger. And as I told you yesterday, if the Reynolds, larger is much larger, the Reynolds number is much larger, you know that LES will <coughs> have problems. So I'm going to show you the things which work. That's the small scale. And the small scale, actually, we, you, the flame starts like this, and it grows, passes through the grids, passes out, and you measure the maximum overpressure over time, and you see if you can match the experiments. This is a typical view of a, of a mesh. Like always, we mesh the outside atmosphere so that we don't have to worry about acoustics. And we spark, or we put a laser energy deposition here at this point, and the flame goes. Uh, it's a strange flame because initially it's laminar until it reaches the obstacles where it gets wrinkled and speeds up. Then it becomes a turbulent flame. So it's a flame which combines actually laminar and turbulent phases, and that makes things more difficult for, for modeling. Uh, when you compare the simulations and the experiments, you, you realize actually uh, you can do extremely well for this flame. And when you compare quantitatively the simulation and uh, the experiment here in gray, you see that you are extremely good. And so this is where the fun begins. You know, in our code, like in many codes, you have multiple turbulent combustion models. We have, for example, one which is called Colin, another one which is called Charlotte. Forget where they come from, they are just different. The thing is that we saw rapidly that Colin was doing a very good job for this one, and Charlotte was not. So we said, okay, let's keep Colin, and we started using Colin for everything, and we didn't change any constant, which is another thing that you should do, but if you do that, you get into problems, as you will see. So we looked at uh, Colin now only, and we checked, for example, uh, the number of grids. So you see here there's only one grid, two grids, three grids. And you see that the code is doing an amazing job. It's capturing exactly the pressure. By the way, you see these bumps here. This is due to acoustics. We just talked about acoustics. You have a box. You put combustion into it. You're going to excite the first acoustic mode. It's going to blum, 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 blum. This is why you see this pressure going up and down and up and up. This is only acoustics. If you don't have a compressible code, you cannot capture that. So you see that you're doing really well, and you capture exactly what you, what you expect. Then we did something else that I will come back on tomorrow. We changed the gas. Okay, you methane, propane, H2, no problem. You capture everything you want. You see, by the way, just a comment here, is that uh, if you have a building full of methane, the overpressure will be 50 millibars. Not that much, you know, like this building, for example, will be okay. If you have a leak with H2, it's more like 800 millibars. Not the same. So you see, when we will have H2 everywhere in this world, we'll hear a lot of booms. 
Now, the problem is this is where the student got, you know, he was finishing his PhD, he said, yeah, well, it's working, let's do it by six. That was a mistake because when you go to six times larger, now this is 1.5 meters, I will not even show you the 25 because it, it's even worse. Then suddenly, uh, when we did the simulation and we, we did the experiment, uh, they did the experiment, uh, you can see a view actually, maybe it will work. Come on. Yeah, you can see the experiment on top. Uh, you see the blue flame now. And um, of course, we, the simulation looks like the experiment. Huh? You see the acoustic oscillations here at the end. But when we put things on the same diagram, you see that uh, now Colin is off completely. And actually, Charlotte is a little bit late, but it's you know better in terms of overpressure. And so you reach the same point that most of you will reach. If you use a turbulent combustion model and you tune it, usually everyone tunes it. In a turbulent combustion model, you get 10 constants. So you, you tune them, and then finally it works. It always works. Okay? I've never seen a PhD. A PhD is a wonderful uh, transformer of a problem into a solution if you give him enough screwdrivers. And so it will always work for one case. But then if you go to another case and you say, you can go to the other case, but don't change the constants. In general, you're in trouble. And so this is where we were here, uh, is that, uh, of course, you can do it. But if you don't retune now a little bit your constants, you will not be able to do that. And so that's uh, a general uh, problem today, a main problem, again, and you know why now. The Reynolds number goes up. You may be in deep trouble. Okay, there are many ways to try to fix this. You might say, OK, it's just a problem of resolution. So let's do it with 1 billion cells, the medium. So when we did it with 1 billion cells, of course, it was nice, it was better. But you cannot afford, when we would have to go to the 24 times larger case, we would have needed 100 billion. We couldn't do it. So of course, if you're ready to pay, it would, you, know, you can be good. But you cannot always go to this kind of resolution. And this is the movie you've already shown, I guess. Uh, the scene, uh, you can see here uh, that when you put a lot of points, when the Reynolds increases, you can put a lot of points. But remember that you have to put Reynolds to the power 3, so uh, it's increasing fast. You're able to do something a little bit better, uh, but still, uh, it, it is getting crazy huh, in terms of the number of points you need. OK, uh, I think we can take a break here. I'll talk a little bit about Spark in a, when we come back. Any questions? <coughs> yes? I'm not sure I get what you mean. I mean, so the, all these chambers are open normally, yeah? Great. Yeah, yeah. I will talk about that tomorrow, actually. The question is, if it's the question is how to prevent explosions in mines, yeah, that's the topic I will touch tomorrow. Yeah, yeah you, you can do that. But there are cases, you know, it always ignites at the end of the day, okay? Uh, even if you are careful, there's always someone who will, will okay. create ignition. No, no, this, uh, this, uh, the inventing chambers, the dimensions are larger. The flame is able to go through all the grids. Uh, the grid, uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow when you talk about flame hole interaction. If you want the flame to stop in a hole, the hole has to be of the order of 10 to 50 times the flame thickness. So that's a few millimeters. Okay. So these holes here are too big, the flame goes through. Okay. You cannot stop the flame this way. There was another question up there. Thank you.
You, you, numerics always change these things. Normally, they don't change them too much, okay? But of course, uh, not, not only the change, but the instant at which you spark would change, because if it is a turbulent flow, if you spark a little bit later or a little bit sooner, you will not be at the same moment. You might even change that. But then you have to, uh, to give you some margin. Uh, what I've shown here is quite reliable. I mean, when, the, when you spark too far away, you, don't, you, you, you ignite, but you don't stabilize. I'm not sure, I'm talking about the aerodynamic drag of what? Okay, that's, we don't do that for the moment, okay? When people computing combustion chambers do not worry about the aerodynamics at the same time. Okay? But I see, I see that you should, but we, at the moment it's too complicated. Actually, the codes used for external aerodynamics are not the same as the codes used for combustion chambers. So usually we don't do the optimization that you are mentioning. It, we should, but it's too complicated. Yeah, but that's not the problem of the combustion people. What you mentioned is the problem of the aerodynamics people. They are not in the same department. They don't talk to each other. So, so you, no, you're safe. Okay, uh, we take a short break and we start again in 10 minutes. Let me, let me finish this uh, discussion on uh, ignition by coming back to the starting point which I more or less eluded when I started, which is the initial phase of combustion. The initial phase of combustion is due to, usually to the spark or to the laser, but in both cases you're in trouble. Because as I said, during this phase, uh, the temperature goes to very high levels. You might even not talk about one temperature, but about multiple, because you might be in a plasma phase. And there are all kinds of things occurring during this phase, which makes our life a little bit uh, miserable if you want to be sure to describe exactly what's happening. So as I said, for many cases, we don't, well, we, we, take, we take the lazy way. We just replace the ignition phase by a kernel of burned gases. And usually we take a sphere, not well, or cylinder, depends on the shape of the spark, and we impose a certain amount of temperature inside the, the zone which should be linked to the energy of the spark. Now, the problem is that this, the, this whole thing is a little bit arbitrary. And uh, when, you, when you look actually at, uh, at the spark itself uh, by a plug, you realize that it's much more complicated than that. The first reason being that this is time, you know, and you see here we talk about nanoseconds, so this is a pain, I mean, in the CFD code. We probably don't want to, to, to care too much about this phase. But you see that even during the whole sparking event, the voltage at the electrodes is changing over time, and the current is changing over time. So you cannot really say that it's a fixed amount of energy. It's changing over time, and it's changing in a complicated way. What is even worse is that it may be changing as a function of the flow itself. Why? Well, because we know that if you have a spark between the two electrodes and you're blowing on it very fast, you might actually distort it, which will distort these performances of the electric system. So that for many piston engine models, you actually have to couple the spark model to the flow. And that's complicated. Instead of doing that in many 
uh, codes, we just replace everything by a certain amount of energy. And the way we put the time dependence here or the space dependence of energy into the code is not dictated by physics. It's dictated by the fact that it's difficult to do more than that. One of the reasons, for example, is that if you deposit the same amount of energy in your code than you would do in the experiment, the temperature goes up to 15,000 K, and then your table stop at 5,000 usually, so you're stuck, okay? So most people would tune these things. So every time there is an ignition phase in a CFD code, you must be very careful because usually it's an approximation. So I've shown you this movie. I want to come back to a few notions here uh, about this famous phase. Okay, if you want to be precise about ignition, you need to model the spark itself. They need to, you need to model the electric spark which brings power to the spark plug. For combustion, the only thing we want to know is the energy here. But to do that, you need to model everything. So that's already an additional problem. Then after that, when you start looking at what's happening between the two sides of the electrodes here, about two millimeters, uh, you see that here you start having to talk about nanoseconds, okay? So you go from, everything happens here, you know, after one microsecond, but it's still glowing after a while. So if you need to put all that into your code, it's gonna be a little bit difficult. So after 10 nanoseconds, this is what you see. Uh, and uh, the additional thing that, uh, actually I've seen a movie five minutes ago, yeah? uh, when you put a, a, a spark, you also have a, an acoustic wave, which can be even be a shock wave. Why is that important? Well, there may be ma many reasons. One of them is obvious, is that this shock wave, or this acoustic wave, depending on the conditions, carries energy with it. This energy goes away. So if it goes away, it should not arrive here. So that's a lost term. If you, you say, I've put 50 millijoules in this electric system, well, maybe you've lost 10 or 20 in the shock wave already. So you should not put in the gas. Okay, so, and this you don't always know. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a question which comes back quite often. The other problem which is quite interesting is how do the, does this spark interact with turbulence? Most people agree that initially the spark is so strong that uh, the flame goes as a sphere, which indicates that it doesn't care too much about turbulence. But at some point here, when you start seeing a flame kernel, pretty soon after that, this flame kernel will be distorted by turbulence, which is an additional problem. Then you need to couple this thing with your turbulence model. So when you start talking to people doing uh, ignition, they start producing these things, you know, starting here with nanoseconds, and there you have to worry about which kind of physics you would put there in your plasma phase. And uh, the combustion people, they try to forget that. As I said, they would like to start here, you know, where the flame kernel starts to develop, first laminar, then interaction with the turbulence, and then it would propagate. And so you see that if you need to work on that, uh, it is a complicated story. So the, if someone asks you to work on, a, on a, a ignition, be careful. The, the, as I said, the, the other problem is the effect of the energy on the growth of the spark. Uh, Kelly, here you have a result here showing that as a function of the radius, you have here the time. You see that when you increase the ignition energy, uh, you make the flame always faster. So the flame, in other words, remembers the initial spark, okay? So if you give it a lot of energy initially, it will keep moving fast for a long time. So we don't really know how to model that. I mean, it's not in our models anywhere. Else. We always talk about the flame speed, not about the flame speed of something which has been uh, drugged with a lot of initial energy. So that's a problem. We know for experimentally it's there, but uh, we cannot take it into account. The other thing also is that you may blow on your spark while it's igniting. And that will change also the results. You can prove that by a simple model here. We did that long time ago with, a, with DNS. You know, we just look at the spark and at the same time that we were sparking, we were blowing on the flame front. And you see that uh, this is the energy. If you have enough energy, it's not a problem. But if your energy is not large enough, when you blow on your spark, you actually quench it, which makes sense, you know. It's, it's, uh, 
uh, it's just an additional parameter that you should include in your spark. This is a case where you blow on your spark with a constant speed. But if this is turbulence, then the speed will go up and down and change sign, and then you realize, oh, okay, this is crazy. You cannot predict all that. So it is true that the ignition phase is a problem. Uh, and uh, if you plot here, for example, the domains of ignition as a function of energy, when you start uh, putting a long spark or a fast or intense spark, you will have ignition or not, depending on the speed of the flow when you blow on the spark. So the speed normally should also be a parameter in your, in your model. Now, when you get these very nice pictures here of, uh, this is an experiment, of a spark, you would hope that the spark is just a straight line between the electrodes, but it's not, you know, it can take, you know, all kinds of shape. And then in addition, people doing engines, they have this stupid idea of not making one spark, but multiple spark. <laughs> so then you say, how do I model all that? It just gives you a headache, usually. And uh, of course, there are cases where the spark is continuous. In certain engines, you can do that. That's an additional problem. And as you see here, the sparks are moving because of the flow speed. The, the biggest problem, probably, if you write a CFD code, will be the following. The guys doing the electrical part will tell you 45.62 millijoules. That's what I've put in the electric circuit. But then you say, OK, how much did go in the gas? Oh, oh that, that's your problem. And uh, so you have to worry about the losses. If the losses were small, it would be easy. But in practice, for a laser spark, you know, the energy which goes in the spark is only 10% of the energy that you deposit because you know, things are lost to shock wave, radiation. So at the end of the, of the sparking event, only 10%, when they say 10, it may be 5 huh, or 20. And if you use a, a normal spark, electrical spark, uh, those guys here, Mali was a guy working at Mercedes, you know, a long time ago, and they did a lot of measurements there. And you see the same thing here. The problem of this electric spark is that you, you heat up the electrodes, and the heat goes right away into the electrode itself, okay? because it's a metal. And uh, if you have heat in front of it because of conduction, it goes back into the metal. And so you see that he estimated maybe 65% of the energy going back to the electrodes which is great until this guy showed up 10 years later and says it's only 515. OK, so basically we don't know. We just know that we have a big amount of energy from the electrical circuit, which is lost. And so, you know, if you put 10% in your CFD model of the energy in the ignition model, or 35 or 30, it will, of course, not be the same flame. And so it is clear that the uncertainties when you do CFD of an ignition problem are quite big. So this is a scheme which summarizes what I told you. Uh, this is the electric energy which is available. Uh, and this is where it goes. You know, some losses go to the shock wave. Some losses go back to the electrodes, to the radiation. And at the end, what you have to put in the CFD code is the thermal energy, the, the, the thing that, that increases the temperature of the gas. Don't care about the rest when you do CFD. OK. That's all I wanted to say about, uh, about uh, ignition. Question, yeah? Um, why is it that the, you know, the initial amount of energy changes uh, the Is it because there's like a bigger radical Oh, yeah. Well, actually, when you, when you ignite a gas with a lot of energy, you put the temperature to 3,000, 4,000, and then the, <laughs> the kinetics love it. So it, it boosts combustion by a large amount. So the flame speed goes up by a large amount because you have so many hot gases in the center of the kernel. It's really chemistry. Huh? It's a chemical effect. OK, so so much for ignition. I want to, to, to turn. I'm you know, going through quite a long list of, uh, of uh, phenomena that you should know. And this one now is a, is a fun one. It's, uh, it's, you know, all of us, we have the same ambition when you look at the problem. We hope that if you define the problem well enough, there's only one solution. Unfortunately, for combustion, there are cases where for one problem, there can be more than one solution. Of course, you know that oh, there is one obvious case is that there's the ignited solution and the non-ignited solution. But even for the ignited solution, I want to show you now that you can have more than one solution, more than one flame, in other words. So when you compute any flame, 
you hope, and this is necessary if you want to do science, that you can control the number of input parameters, that there is no hidden input parameters. So typically for a flame, you know, normally if you know the flow rate of fuel and the temperature, same for the air, normally you know everything. Okay, it should, it's the only thing which are needed to, to define the state of the flame. Well, in practice, when I was doing my, my PhD thesis, I was never working when it was cold because I knew that in cold conditions, my chamber was stable and I, I was studying instabilities. So when it was too cold, I didn't come to the lab. So uh, it means that there are things here when you say flow rates, well, then you have to worry also about humidity. I've shown you yesterday, well, today that uh, certain aircraft uh, engines, when the air is humid, they become unstable. So there's a long list of hidden things. One of them, which is really bad, is the leaks of your system. If you have a small leak anywhere, for example, for instabilities, it will change everything. But anyway, suppose that you control everything here. Suppose that uh, you are really controlling everything. You are repeating the same experiment. Is it possible that you can have you know, different flames? And we will call that, uh, we will call that different states. And uh, here, again, we need to go back to chaos and bifurcations. You know, the, this, this whole field of physics, which shows actually that certain systems can bifurcate from one state to another. And uh, this is what I want to explain here for, for flame. So we're going to take uh, an example, which comes actually from the, the gas turbine community. And uh, this is a work we did with uh, Ansaldo. And these guys from Ansaldo were telling us, you know, when we start a gas turbine, you don't start it right away at full power. You start it for, you know, uh, you ignite it, and then you wait. And after two minutes, you go to full power. And if you try to go to full power right away, it doesn't work. So, uh, and here, when you do that, the noise remains reasonable. And when you go to full power, the noise is always reasonable. While if you try to go right away to the right conditions, uh, the noise gets crazy which tells you that there must be something in this chamber where uh, at some point the chamber changes something. So you ignite it and there's a waiting period and then suddenly the flame flips to another position. And at the first position you cannot operate, at the second position you can operate. So there must be two states for the same flame. So that was one of the questions that we tried to investigate uh, uh, numerically. And the first thing I want to show you is that you don't even need combustion to do that. Even without combustion, you can have multiple states for the same flow, especially if it is swirled. This is an experiment of Vanier Schott uh, published some time ago. It's a very simple one. You have the axis of symmetry here, and you have a swirl flow entering here uh, through this jet here. And uh, he has measured the flow field in front of this thing uh, for a certain number of uh, swirl numbers. That means the rotation of the jet. So here you have the hole, here you have the jet. When there is no swirl, that means the velocity here is only in the plane of the screen, uh, you have a jet, you know, that's normal jet. Everyone knows that. So when you increase the swirl now, uh, you see it's changing a little bit. You go to point four, you start seeing what we have mentioned already, a central recirculation zone. Then you keep increasing the swirl to point five six, and you get a larger recirculation zone, you go to point 0.9, you, you get a very big one. And then you go the other way. Okay, this is where things get crazy. You, now you decrease it again. Instead of point 0.9, you go back to point 0.56, and to point 0.5, and to zero. And you see that the states that you reach now are not the states you had when you were going up, which is a problem. Uh, because now, for example, at point 0.56, this is what you have when S increases. And this is what you have when S decreases. So you have hysteresis, bifurcations, the way you want to call that. But it tells you that there is two solutions for the same flow rate. Okay? And it's not even a question of temperature here. Everything's cold. So it's a good indication that you might expect problems when you're studying swirl flames. So you can also check that. That's what they did here. You, we do this, what you call the bifurcation <laughs> diagrams. You start, for example, for this, from this point, you increase the swirl, and you measure the pressure losses. The pressure losses are a good indicator of the flow. Huh? And uh, you see that when you increase the swirl and then you go back, 
Well, indeed, here, when you go back to this point, it doesn't have the same pressure losses as this one. That tells you that it's not the same flow. OK, now we turn to combustion. This is an, uh, a bench which is installed in Italy. And we computed one swirl here. You can see the processing vortex score here. That's the unstable uh, 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 axis here of rotation of the, of the swirl flow. And uh, we are going to look at this flow. And uh, we are going to uh, operate it with combustion. Of course, uh, we look only at one burner. This is a serious combustion chamber, as you can see here. This, the power of this guy is about uh, one half a nuclear power plant. 30 meters long, or something like this. So, of course, we compute only one burner, not the whole machine. So that's, there are 24, so we take one of these guys here, and we, we just compute it when it's installed in a chamber which has been adapted to do a single burner chamber. So the chamber is a little bit complicated. Uh, that's typical of industry. You know? uh, you have uh, what we call a diagonal swirler. Here, those are veins, like this one, where you inject methane through these small holes. And you have air passing around it so that it mixes. This is, again, what the Germans call technically premixed. That means normally, by the time you reach the chamber, which is here, you have time to mix. And so this should be a premixed flame. But you also inject here some methane for historical reasons. They will not tell you exactly why. But these things are here to stabilize the flame, basically. And here, those things are diffusion flames because you inject pure methane, and it has no time to mix by the time it reaches the, the, the chamber. So this is a, actually a good example of the complexity of real burners. When you leave the lab where you have squares you know, and simple flows, when you reach those guys in industry, they face different problems. So you mesh this guy. It's a little bit interesting, but I will not go into the details. That's not the, 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 the objectives. And uh, you do a flame. So here you see we start from an operating point one. I don't need to tell you which one it was. It's a flame which is anchored on the lips here <coughs> of the injector. And this is an isosurface of temperature colored by velocity. It has this typical shape of swirl flames. It is anchored in the center, and it comes back to the side. And this is a very efficient flame, very nice. And what you can do is you go to an operating point two, and in the LES, you do it in a brutal way. You just change the flow rate, bim. And then you see that when you do that, the flame that you obtain is not anchored anymore. You see that? It's completely quenched here. Okay? So it's a different flame. OK, you, you, say, uh, you ask the students, how did you do that? The guy says, well, I just changed all the boundary conditions together and go. OK, let's, say, okay, let's try it differently now. Can you change things one after the other? You put a little bit more fuel here. You change the pressure, et cetera, et cetera. He did that. And at the end, what he obtained is a flame for the operating point two, which is now attached. Okay. So the, the way we change the boundary conditions is actually changing the result. Which means that now, if you look at point two, we have an attached case and a detached case for the same flow rate. And it's not like the experiment now. We know we get the same humidity, the same temperature of everything. It's exactly the same case, but with two solutions. And then you get into problems, because, for example, you, if you want to compare your data with the experimentalist, you have to know if they are in state one or state two. They don't know. Huh? The, so you know that uh, the fact that you can have two solutions for the same problem is obviously going to be a problem. So we try to investigate this question by asking ourselves, how do you go from one solution to, the, to another? We know that both are right. Huh? Uh, the question is, why do we find two? So this B stability, of course, by stability, appears right away in the temperature field. You, or you, uh, you can see here temperature where the flame is attached. It's attached here, close to the end of the chamber. When it's detached, you know, it, there's nothing here. Everything is cold here. And uh, you will see how you go from one to the other. This is the velocity field. And of course, it's also very different because when the flame is here and it's ignited, it's pushing the fresh gases on the side. So they have to accelerate. As you can see here, they are faster than here. Where they have more time, the flame is sitting much more downstream. And again, remember, it's the same flow. 
So if you do cuts now uh, at these points here, uh, of course, they are very different. The flame which is attached is hot at the first plane, while the other one is fully cold, okay? And you have to go very far downstream so that they match. So here, there's not even, I mean, if you want to compare two experiments, you don't know which one you should compare. And so it, it is obviously a very, different, uh, a very different flow. Same thing for the, the here, the, the velocity profiles, which are very different. Now, let me jump to, uh, to the, 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 the instantaneous fields. There's a guy I did not discuss too much yet. That's the famous PVC, the processing vortex core. I told you already, you know, that in, a, in this world chambers, the axis of the rotating vortex actually turns also. It has appreciation. And you can see it here. This is the axis of the vortex, and it's rotating like this. And when the flame is detached, this vortex is here. When the flame is attached, it's not there. In other words, there's a competition between the flame being here or the PVC being here. When the flame is here, this is full of burn gases, and the PVC cannot survive. If the flame is not here, then the PVC can develop. And so you see that there is this uh, competition between two phenomena, and that, that explains also why we can have two states for the same thing. So we want to try to do something now. We're going to try to see how we can go from one to the other. Okay. So I'm going to do that in two ways. You know, I've mentioned that before, that in this swirler here on the axis, they inject fuel, pure fuel, because it helps for stabilization. So our first idea was to say, well, can we go from one to the other by changing the amount of fuel that we inject here. And the second idea also is that when you do these simulations, you always wonder about their stability domain. In other words, you may have a solution, but if the air flow rate would fluctuate, maybe this solution is unstable. <coughs> so we tried also to pulsate the inlet here of the air to see if the flame reacts and if the flame actually moves from one state to another. So let me start by the... the, the the pilot fuel. The pilot fuel flow rate is the amount of fuel that you inject through the central lens here. Uh, the reference value was imposed, and so we define the PFR parameter, which measures how much we impose compared to the reference value. And we started from one, and we went to four, either starting from an attached or starting from a detached flame. So let me just show you the results here. Here, this is the moment where we increase the pilot flow rate. So this flame is attached, and we put more and more fuel in the center of the, of the system. And now that you are combustion experts, you should recognize what's happening here is that if you put more fuel here, this thing gets so rich that at some point the flame stops, and you can actually see that the flame moves away from the center. So it is true that if you put a lot of fuel in the center here, but we multiply it by four, that's quite a large amount. Then you can go from attached to detached. Now, you can build those diagrams. We did quite a few simulations to, to match that, and you see here the results. This is the PFR, so there's the pilot fuel ratio, and this is the state, so this is detached, and this is attached. So if you start from an attached case, and you increase the flow rate, you just saw that you can go to detached. But when you do the same thing for the detached case, you can do what you want. You never can come back here. In other words, it, it doesn't help to inject a lot of fuel. If the flame is detached, it will stay detached. Which, you know, again, uh, it's always the same thing with combustion. Uh, you might think that uh, once you are here, when this flame is detached and you inject a lot of fuel here, suddenly the flame would come back, but that doesn't work that way. For the flame to come back, it's not enough to have fuel. You need temperature. And you cannot have a lot of hot gases here because you get this PVC turning around, cleaning the place, and it's, it's not possible to bring the flame back. So that explains the, the, the transition between the, these cases. It's just not possible in that way. So the last thing we tried is to wonder now, uh, suppose that this flame, for some reason, has a perturbation of flow rate. Can that be enough for the flame to come back or to lift from its position? So here, 
we started pulsating the flames with a strong uh, variation of the air flow rate. Right? So this is first the example where you can see the pulsation. It's pretty strong. Huh? Now the flame is attached. And you see that when you pulse it, well, you know, it's moving, but you cannot take it away from here. It's always staying there, and it's not ready to go away. And even if we pulsate it to 45 percent, which is enormous, we see that it's resisting any change. In other words, uh, when the flame is attached, you cannot move it away. Okay? It's, just a, it's just a place where it wants to be. Now, when the flame is detached, now things are different. If you start pulsating it, you see that it is, it's hesitating, and then suddenly it comes back to the injector here. And now it stays there because we know already that if it is attached, it cannot go away. We just did it before. So you see that now these two things are not equal. The detached flame is sensitive to a pulsation, which will bring it back here. The attached flame is insensitive, which tells you that among these two solutions, one of them is more stable than the other. And this is the attached solution. Actually, when you talk to these guys at Ansaldo, they will tell you that they know that the the position they want is the attached flame. And so when it is detached, it's not good. It's the case where you cannot go to full power. It will be unstable. So you need to move away from the, the detached flame to go back to the attached flame. This is, I think, another movie. Yeah, it's the same uh, sequence here where we start from the detached flame and we pulsate it and you see the flame coming back. And now it's stuck to the injection system. And so by talking to these guys uh, on Saldo, they confirmed actually that uh, quite often when you ignite, the flame is lifted. And you have to wait until somehow, because of a perturbation, it comes back here. And when it's here, then you can go to, to full power. So you can build here, uh, again, a bifurcation diagram as a function of the amplitude of forcing, where if you start from attached, you will always be attached, whatever you do. So this is a stable state. But if you start from detached, you can bring it back to a reasonable position, which is attached. And what you want to have on the long term, of course, is an attached flame. So this is not, you know, again, a, a major problem. I think you do the experiments, you do the LES, and you, you understand uh, what's going on. But it is a problem if you do experiments in the lab, or uh, even if you're an engineer, you have to recognize that things might depend on a state. And so they might change, and they might, you might have more than one solution for the same problem, which is never a good idea. OK, um, I think I will stop here for today and we, so that we can take a, a few questions before we go to the banquet. Sure, if you change the geometry now, it's an additional parameter in the game, okay? And you have to find a geometry which satisfies all the other criteria and which would avoid that. And they don't want to do that. They, 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 they know that if they change something, they're going to change the knocks or the ignition or the instability. So, of course, you could imagine having something which would resist, uh, but it's, uh, they don't do that. Normally, it's too complicated. They don't like that. I mean, those, those machines are monsters, okay? Uh, any other question for today? Yes. Yeah, it's very large. Is there a minimum amplitude that they can reattach? Yeah, actually, we tried. Uh, I think it's here. We tried at 30, and 30 was not enough. I believe it's too much. Uh, it seems a bit strong. Uh, and, well, also you have to realize that uh, the. When they do that, at the same time, they increase the velocity of the air continuously. So this is, this is strong, too. So we don't really know there. Other questions? Yeah. It is probably dependent a, a, a little bit. But when you look at the process here, 
what's important is that the velocity must decrease enough for the flame to go back. So once this happens, once in a cycle, that's enough. So we can do it at different frequencies. I think it will still work. The important thing is that velocity should go down for a little while so that the flame can crawl from here to here. And since this is a recirculation zone, then once it is there, then it's finished. It stays there. But again, you know, you do the simulation, you don't understand everything. It's just, uh, that's just the result, yeah. Yeah. Is it possible to try things like an acoustic model to, to get some idea of what could be, like since you're, since you're forcing it with, with pulses, is there any point in trying to do like some yeah. sort of acoustic model? Or? Yeah, for, for this flame, acoustics don't play really a role, okay? Uh, um, because uh, this is not a commercial instability, and this thing is not coupled to the acoustics of the chamber. We just force it acoustically, but there is no resonance here. So I don't think you could, uh, you could do a lot of things with acoustics on this problem. That was my question. Is it, you're introducing acoustic instability by doing this. But. Okay, that's the other thing. The, the 45 person I've mentioned, those flames are naturally unstable. So the lifted flame by nature is unstable. So it's also quite possible that in the real engine, it starts oscillating like what I've shown with active control. It oscillates maybe for five or 10 cycles that you don't even hear. And if it oscillates, it comes back to the stable case. In other words, it may be true that uh, if there is an instability that we, we did not see it, but maybe that's what's happening in the experiment. The stable flame, the one which resists instabilities is not the lifted one. The lifted one will go away if there is an instability. That may be an explanation. But again, then no one can do the experiment in the real engine, okay? It's just too complicated. But that could be an explanation, yeah. How did the operators of the actual machine so that it was attached to the They have a procedure. Uh, they wait uh, 30 seconds or something like that, and then they look at the accelerometers, and if it's below a certain level, then they, they go to full power. But they're not allowed to start full power. Uh, they know it's, it's, it's not working. Uh, for, for these machines, they have accelerometers a little bit everywhere. And if they go beyond a certain level, it switches down the CH4 anyway. So they, 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 they are not allowed to do that. Yes? Okay, the question is to know the, the effect of subgrid scale parameters on these simulations. Okay, this, uh, the answer is there is certainly an effect, but when you go to these big machines, you take the models that you have developed on academic cases and you just pray that they work <laughs> because it's too late. You know, here the Reynolds number is huge and you just do what you can. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure the subgrid scale model would play a role, but. Again, uh, it's very difficult to quantify. We, we, you, you cannot test everything in every configuration. That's why it's so important to have clean academic cases where you can compare and be sure that your model is right. But as we have shown you, the problem is that th these academic cases have a low Reynolds number, while these machines have a large Reynolds number. So whatever you do, you always face the problem that you have models validated on small scales, small pressure, small Reynolds number, and then you have to apply them to big scale and big Reynolds number, big pressures. And that's a major issue. And we, we keep fighting, you know, we, we see people in industry, they want to work with our codes to do everything, you know, and we tell them, well, be careful. It's, we do not guarantee, you know, uh, uh, the results. That's the, I think that's also a problem when they buy the code, you know, or they would like you to sign something saying that, uh, if it doesn't work, you're going to be reimbursed. No, no way. I mean, it's just, <laughs> we, it's just I don't want to go bankrupt. It's, 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 this is the state of the art. You have to be honest about it. It's the, at this Reynolds number, it's very difficult. It, it is amazingly difficult. Uh, another question? Nope. Okay, tomorrow we'll do uh, the, 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 the most fun things. Let's say we talk about H2, flame oil interaction, and we'll see that. Uh, that should be uh, cool to finish. So I see you tonight at the banquet, actually. Thank you.